we are back with, we, we checked the rankings, our number one friend of the show, Josh Keatley. Sorry, Donovan. Sorry, Jeffrey. <laughs> Tough competition. A lot of contenders out there, but there can only be one number one, and there he is, Josh Keatley. I will shortly be joined by my always effervescent co-host, the one, the only baby-faced assassin, Brock Bear, will be with us shortly. But with no further ado, I'm excited about the Big Ten because I don't think, I mean, there's still obviously the sort of Big Two thing, but I think that the gap is narrowing, and we'll see if Josh agrees or disagrees with me. I think that there will be at least one loss in conference by one of the Big Two to someone other than each other, and I'll see if he agrees with me. Uh, as we walk through this schedule and as we look at, well, we'll start sort of with the end of last season, um, which may not have gone exactly the way Mr. Keatley wanted it to, but <laughs> it happens. But we'll take a look at last year and then look forward to this year. We'll talk a little about the transfer portal. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Now it's a party. Now oh, it's a party. Oh, yeah. Lord. This, this ain't good. Yeah, yo, it is. It's better than good. It's great. Um, so, um, we're, I'm going to ask the initial question, what he thought of Ohio State season, then we'll talk about the Big Ten as a whole, and then we'll dive into the other question. So, I'm going to go to the one, the only Mr. Josh Keatley, and we're going to find out what Josh thinks of Ohio State season and what things they might want to do differently this year. So, last year, I, I mean, I know that a lot of people are, are happy because they made it to the playoffs and they hung with Georgia and they, you know, they almost beat Georgia. A lot of people weren't expecting that. But to me, it's still a disappointment because you got to look at kind of like what, what's laid out in front of you. What did you know was going to happen? And, you know, how did you prepare for that? And there was really only a couple big games, right? You know, you got Notre Dame, the handle, but that doesn't really count, right? Marcus Freeman's first game and all that. You know, a Penn State, JT Tulum-Maloa went, went, went off. Uh, but then Michigan, you got to handle your stuff. You know, this is the second year in a row. They didn't just lose, they got embarrassed. And it was the defense, the whole thing. They restructured the entire defensive coaching staff, and they still looked absolutely atrocious. So I, I would, I'm going to go ahead and classify if it's if I have to say yay or nay to that season. It was a bad season. It was a nay. It was, a, it was not good. Um, you know, almost lose, almost beating Georgia, barely losing to Georgia. I'm still thinking Ryan Day is on the hot seat. I mean, that's embarrassing. They got trounced by their main rival, the main objective, two years in a row, snuffed out of the Big Ten championship game. I mean, honestly, I was telling people, I try to be as unbiased as possible. Ohio State didn't even deserve to be in the playoffs last year. There needs to be some kind of system, you know, checks and balances. And in my eyes, they didn't they didn't reach that. You don't you don't get to lose and get a magical bye week and then slip in. That that to me is not right. So I, I feel like it was a bad season. The defense has to improve. I mean, I think we're all on the same page. Ryan Day knows how to call mean offense. You know, he does a great job on the offense, and the offense has got star power for days. Marvin Harrison Jr., Mecca Gupta, Trayvon Henderson, you know, Mayan Williams, Cade Stover, all those guys are very, very good, all-American caliber players. Donovan Jackson, uh, you know, even Julian Fleming was a former five-star guy that dealt with some injuries, and the guys they're bringing in can, can play Carnell Tate, guys like that. But the defense, uh, they were bad. They were flat-out bad. The defensive backs were bad. You know, we'll see if they improve this year, but, you know, I don't want to keep rambling on about it, but that's the biggest thing is that defense has to show real improvement. I don't care what they do against Rutgers. I don't care what stats you want to spit at me about them, you know, smashing Indiana. No, what do they do against the big three, right? We're, you're going to have big – there's the big three this year. It's Notre Dame, Penn State, Michigan. What did they do against them? That's how I'm judging their season. Fair enough. Um, I'm going to – because I'm a gentleman – let Brock go first with the first of his questions. What questions do you have for the one, the only, number one friend of the show, Josh Keeley? Well, before I start, I just want to say it is, of course, a pleasure to have Josh Keeley back on the show. I mean, this guy is a very knowledgeable person. He's a jack of all trades. He's a writer, phenomenal analyst. He's even a cultivator of delicious foods out there in the great state <laughs> of Ohio. Someone who I feel isn't a jack of all trades is Ryan Day. You hit on all the points of why you know people have viewed, despite going having eleven win seasons, having yep. his seasons be failures. It almost feels like Lloyd Carr all over again, but this time 
he's in Columbus. Do you feel that if Ryan Day doesn't accomplish the two main goals this season, which is to make the college football playoff and to beat Michigan, a team that they are going to go on the road to play, that he will be ousted in favor of somebody else? Or do you think that he still has a little bit more leash left to no, hang himself I, with? I think he should be. I, I, I think he should be. First of all, I like Ryan Day. I, I've been – you know, every Ohio State coach that that's a lot, you know, even Earl Bruce, Ryan Day is by far the nicest person that you will ever meet, a very good human being. Very, so I like him, and I think he's a good coach. I still stand by the fact I think he's a top ten head coach in college football. But there are blatant issues. I don't think he needs to be calling the offense by himself. I don't think he needs to do that. You know, I think Jimbo Fisher was the last guy to call an offense when it was shift too much and then he's he he knows it's too much and he said he was going to go hire an offensive coordinator and he hired brian harlan who's never called a play you know he's never going to call plays that just you completely i I, that i just i don't understand that thought process but that that's not answering your question if he doesn't win the big 10 championship i think that there's still room for him to keep his job if he loses to michigan i really truly do because michigan has built themselves a powerhouse right it's not you know this is not it wouldn't be an upset if they lose so I don't think that that's completely fair to judge him on one game or one game. Only. But if they don't, if they don't somehow win the Big Ten with that Michigan loss, or if that's what keeps them out, he's out. He's you got it. You got to move on. You got to move on. He was handed the keys to keys to a Ferrari, and he's done a great job. He's done a great job, but he's got to kick in the next year. You know what I mean? Like at a certain point, it's kind of like when Minnesota had Glenn Mason, right? And they were winning eight, nine games a year, but at some point, you know, Marion Barber and Lawrence Maroney, they were cranking it out. They were cranking out W's. But at some point, you got to stare at it and go, is there more? Can we get more? Now, Minnesota ended up being wrong, but this is Ohio State. So I, I, even if they make the playoffs, you can't, I don't think that that, needs, that can sway your opinion. Because if they get bumped out of the first round of the playoffs and they don't win the Big Ten Championship, you know they got their, the Ohio State, there are certain programs that are going to get a bump, right? The Buckeyes, you get a Buckeye bump, right? Alabama, they get a bump, right? Just like when you talk about recruits, right? If Ohio State offers a three-star, you're going to be a four-star tomorrow. So making the playoffs doesn't mean anything right now. That's why I think there needs to be a checks and balances. It doesn't mean anything because there's a 95% chance they lose to Michigan, they lose, or they don't go to the Big Ten Championship, and they still get in the playoffs anyway. So that doesn't mean anything to me. He's got he's got to win a bit. He's got to finish the season strong. That's, in my opinion, that he has to, or else he, I'm firing him. That's what I would do. God bless him. <laughs> I love that you started it. God bless him. I mean, he's, 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 Nicely he's, done, sir. Nicely done. Yes. 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 Everybody knows who Irving Myers is a human being at this point, right? And I don't think Irving Myers is necessarily a bad human being. I want to be very clear about that. That's a very harsh thing to say. But he's not a personable person. Ryan Day is. You bump into Ryan Day at Kroger, he's going to give you a smile and a photo. And So I really, really, really want to root for him. I really, really do. He's a very pleasant individual and it's really hard to find in the landscape of college football you guys interview guys you guys see it people don't want to admit it that that is the cold hard truth that nice guys they don't typically make it they don't they're not good head coaches so i really want him to be i really want him to do it finish strong but you know really really nice guys don't make his head coaches i've heard a lot of people come out and say pat fitzgerald was a great guy and you know, I'm sorry, that was a that was a nice oh, but oh. that's not his Big Ten football. You, oh. you don't have to bring it up. But real question this time: you always talk about Ryan Day because he's the head man, but a head man can only be as strong as his assistant coaches. We already talked about Brian Hartline, but this is the second year Jim Knowles, a defense coordinator. How much faith do you have that this defense will be improved, and some of those players can get to the caliber of years past that Ohio State used to produce? Uh, uh, when they hired Jim Knowles, I, I was against it. I did not like that. Um, you know, I didn't like the style of defense he had. Uh, you know, I, I felt like it fit the region, the Big 12, a little bit different than what you expect in the Big 10. But I think that that kind of showed that that was true because Michigan basically pounded him in the face twice. But, uh, you know, obviously the first one wasn't his fault. But I, I, there is optimism there. He's an intelligent guy. He's a good coach. You can talk to him. You can see what he's doing. You know, I, I was on the – we were on the show uh, – I was on the show previously. He does make adjustments, but he he's – and he's very aggressive. And sometimes that burns you, right? I don't necessarily think that Michigan destroyed him. They were – you know, Ohio State was in a very good spot going into halftime and things snowballed. And that's the problem with Jim Knowles and the kind of defense that he runs. When they do lose, you know, it, it, it is going to snowball. Uh, but there's potential there. You know, there's a lot of talent. There's no denying it. There, you know, there's got five stars everywhere. And if he can put the right pieces in the right spot, you know, he's got that special little jack position or 
whatever you want to call it. And he had Jack Sawyer there last year. Jack, that might have been a waste of Jack Sawyer's talent. Right, he works very well in space for a defensive end, but now you're looking at a guy like Sonny Styles, who's put on some more weight, six foot four, can rush the passer, bounce back in coverage. You got the former five star linebacker CJ Hicks that might be a better, uh, a better, better fit for him. Um, you know, things he now he's got another year under his belt. I assume that he's going to have a better hold as to what he wants to do rather than just placing everything where he just basically glancing at it and then rolling the dice. Right, I don't think he's going to do that this year, so I do have more faith in him. I don't think that the Ohio State defense is ever going to be back to the caliber of like D'Antonio, right? I don't think he's that kind of guy where they're going to be sending four defensive linemen in the first round every year. I don't think he's that kind of guy or ever going to be. But he can be a good enough defensive coordinator to let Ryan Day and that offense win some big games. I truly do believe that. And this is this will be a good year to show it because there's a lot of talent. And Absolutely. At another place where traditional Ohio State has been strong, but I don't feel that they have the strength this year, is the running back position. I know you can speak to this you know, with yep. personal experience because you are running back yourself, but I'm not a big fan of that running back room right there right now. What are your feelings on it? I truly believe that when this group was fully healthy, this is the best running back room in the country. Really? I, I feel like I feel like Trayvon Henderson, fully healthy, is a potential first-round pick, and I feel the same thing about Mayan Williams. Mayan Williams, and, and they complement each other so Darn well, man. Trayvon catches the ball well out of the backfield. He's quick. He's elusive. He makes you pay. You know, you got a third and one or, you know, a, a third and two. And Mayan Williams is, is you know, you're, you're I, and, you know, I know you guys watch the USFL. You're Darius Victor bowling ball type. And he does a darn, darn good job of doing that, right? He basically won the game for him against Northwestern in that cold, windy game. Dalen Hayden, when he had to step up to the plate, that guy was very good. I mean, I know that the Tennessee was knocking down his door to get him down there to be the lead back. That's a guy, you know, that's a guy who could literally be an SEC lead back, and he's their third stringer. There's those guys. I think that all I, – I think that Travion Henderson and Mayan Williams could be all Big Ten. I really, 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 truly do. I really love those guys. The problem is is that they have this perception – because you're not the only one, right? I'm in the minority for the thoughts that I have about those guys. But th- those are because that's because of injuries. I mean, Trayvon Henderson, two years ago, if you read all the preseason mags and all the crap like that, and in the last season, people had him on a Heisman list. Had him on Heisman list. And he, you know, busts up his foot. You know how, how that, that lingers and how that goes on. And now he's kind of written off. Mayan Williams, you know, no one, he was, he's kind of an underdog story, you know, three star running back from Cincinnati, stayed at home. Um, so no one really had him on their, any other Heisman ballots. But that's another guy that had, showed streaks and had bumped and bruised with injuries and kind of fought through it. Those dudes are dogs, though. Those are the kind of guys that have, you know, seven, eight-year careers in the NFL. They fit. They check a lot of boxes. Absolutely. Yeah, last question for me before I swing this over to Bill. Obviously, 2023, the schedule is looking a little bit different, a lot tougher than it was yeah. the previous year. You guys have to go at Notre Dame. You guys play at Purdue, a place where you guys have struggled in the past. You yeah. guys play Penn State at home, but Penn State has a really dynamic quarterback running back combo. You go on the road at Wisconsin with Luke Fickle, you know, native son of Ohio State, as now their head coach, and obviously finish up the season yeah. at Michigan. Do you feel confident that Ohio State can run? Let's let's not talk about the Michigan game for a second. Everybody else, do you feel confident that Ohio State can run the table against that that schedule? No, not at all. Matter of fact, um, you know, people ask me for betting advice, which I don't know why because I, I do have a losing record. Just want to put that out there. But I do gamble a lot. I give away a lot of money. But uh, <laughs> mood. I put I put money on Michigan to go to the college football playoffs because the odds were I couldn't understand why Ohio State was was the favorites. Um, I just I can't understand that, and I would put money on Penn State over Ohio State as well. Um, you know, it's a, it, like you said, it's a murderer's row. You got a, a first year starting quarterback. Um, it's a little unreasonable to expect that. You know, I know that there's going to be a, quite a few night games. Um, I, I just it's it's a it's a it's a pretty hard slate. I, you talked about Purdue. I think that they're going to handle it. It's Ryan Walter's first year, um, I, and I'm not worried about that. I think they're going to put the hammer down on them. You talked about Wisconsin. It's Luke Fick, Luke Fickle's first year. They're basically changing the entire culture of Wisconsin. I, I'm not worried about that either. I think Wisconsin's going to be very improved. I think they're going to be a good team, but I'm not worried about them. The three that I am worried about as you're going at Notre Dame pretty early in the season, you're not quite sure if Kyle McCord's going to have his footing yet. You know, the defensive backs, Ohio State's defensive backs were pretty bad last year. There's no there's no getting around it. So they're going to have to figure out and hopefully be meshed by then. Um, I think that they can win that game. I think that they can handle their stuff. But, that you know, that's one that I have started. Like, eh. um, you know, Penn State, 
that's one. If you made me put my money down right now, I'm probably taking Penn State. It's really hard to find a weakness. The biggest weakness is on offense is probably their quarterback, Jewel R, who I got to see at Medina, another former four-star, five-star recruit that Ohio State was talking to at one point. That's your biggest weakness. And the only reason, is it really a weakness that the guy doesn't play that much? You know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah, there's a big question mark over it, but I don't know if that's a weakness because I've seen that guy sling the ball. And I'm pretty sure he can make that offense scoot probably better than it did ever did under Sean Clifford. You know, their biggest weakness on defense is, I guess, their defensive backs because they lose Joey Porter Jr., but Caitlin King's a dog. Um, I think he led the Big Ten in, like, past deflections last year or something like that. I mean, he's, he's a really good shutdown corner, and they always reload there. So those are your two biggest weaknesses, and they're pretty good. That's probably where I'd put the L if I had to put one. Michigan, I, I'd be willing to put the money on Ohio State right now against Michigan, no matter the spread, because Ryan Day is going to have – They have Ohio State has more talent than Michigan. That's never been the issue. The issue is are they ready and is Michigan more physical and is, are they going to beat Ohio State to the ground? And I don't think that happens this year because they're going to have it circled, marked, whatever you need. Um, I think that they're going to expect a couple different things this year. Michigan – they don't have the most dynamic passing attack. They didn't last year. I don't want to say they got lucky, but those, you know, J.J. McCarthy was throwing up some floaters. I think that that changes. I don't think those floaters get completed this year. At least that's the goal. If they, they are, we're in trouble. You know, and I, I don't know if that defense is going to – I mean, that defense is always very good, but, you know, Ohio, that's not Ohio State's problem. They, they score plenty of points. So those are the big three. If I had to say which one they're probably going to lose to, I would probably put my money on Penn State. So – First of all, that's the headline when we put this up. That Josh Keatley, Ohio State homer, picks Penn State to knock the ball. Um, but, <laughs> but I do have some, I have some definite questions. And I, it makes me feel smart because I, I, I one of my dark horse teams to make the college football playoffs this year was Penn State. Yeah. And some people looked at me like I was nuts, and I might be. But I think I agree with you. Um. I think I said to Brock one time, can a player be both clutch and bad? And, of course, I was referring to Sean Clifford, who yeah. was some, both clutch and bad. Um, he would be, I would say, a bottom 20 percentile big, you know, cl- you know, big five quarterback for three quarters of a game. And there would be three or four big plays, a third and 17, and he would some, like pull it out of, what? Um, so, so he was this odd coverage of clutch and bad. But um, – I want, to, I want to walk through the depth chart with you, and I want you to uh, tell me where you think there would be some legitimate battles or controversies or uncertainty or whatever term. Okay, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., no. Uh, Julian, Flem- <laughs> Julian Fleming, question mark. Uh, Jaden Bullard, Noah Rogers, question mark. Xavier Johnson, question mark. Yeah. Amika Abuka, no. Um, Brandon Ennis, question mark. So, so obviously, two no, we don't need to discuss at all, and then maybe one we maybe need to discuss amongst the wide receivers. So I'll start with the wide receiver group. You have two of the top wide receivers in college football coming back, one who's just a redshirt sophomore and, and one who's actually both were just redshirt sophomores, which seems unfair. Yeah, so I, I, I think that you're – I have Julian Fleming. I was actually reaching for my projected depth chart. Um, I have Julian Fleming as the number three guy. I'm biased towards Julian Fleming. That's the guy. That's kind of what he was getting recruited right as I started working at Buckeyes Wire. So that's kind of like the first five star that I really dove into since starting at Buckeyes Wire. And he's got some OBJ vibes. And he showed flashes last year of being, you know, a potential. I don't. I don't want to say all American, but you know, he's got first round wide receiver potential. There's. There's no. There's no. If ands or buts, he he he, sure, he simply does. But injuries have really marred his career. He's got the size, he's got the speed, but he's got to stay healthy. He had one bad game last year that wasn't affected by health; it was affected by him dropping balls. But that was against Northwestern, and everybody was dropping balls. So I don't really want to hold that against him. I think that he finishes the year strong and could be All Big Ten this year. I made a, a, a my All Big Ten team predictions, and I had him on it. So I think that that's. Huh. The- Another guy that I think that you got, you got to watch out for as far as the freshman goes, I know you named Noah Rogers, you know Brandon Ennis, uh, Cardinal Tate. That was a guy mm. I think a lot of times when people talk, especially when you talk about Ohio State recruiting, is or recruiting in general, when a kid commits earlier, you know where he's going, he kind of loses a little bit of his luster and the yeah. media doesn't give a crap anymore. I think that's kind of what happened to Cardinal Tate. He loses his new player smell. Is that what you're saying, Josh? 
Yeah, you, yeah, and I think that's kind of what happened with Carnell Tate because I mean he he's a dude. I think he's I think he's a guy. If he went to any other Big Ten team, he's starting immediately, and I, I think he makes a lot of noise immediately. He's got the size, he's got the speed. He reminds me a lot of Chris Olave. Very smooth with what he does. He's kind of a jack of all trades type, where where it's like, oh man, there's nothing awesome about him, but he does everything really really well. And he's he's going to be a true freshman. And I, I think that people are sleeping on him because he's just been committed to Ohio State so long, he kind of went down the drain. But Brendan Ennis is the one with all the hype because he waited so long to commit. But Carnell Tate would be the one. I think that he he's – I think Carnell Tate's going to see the field. I, I really, truly do because I think he's that special. But I think Julian Fleming, I mean, I, like I said, I, I I like him. I think that he, he has the potential to end the, team, end the year as an all-Big Ten player um, and, you know, move up draft boards, kind of like Terry McLaurin. Terry McLaurin had a very similar – meteoric rise where he didn't really do it. I mean, I don't think, I think Terry McLaurin, I don't think he caught a touchdown pass until his senior year. So, <laughs> Julian, Julian Fleming's got more than that. So, you know, I think it could be kind of like that where he, on the national stage, people are like, oh man, that Julian Fleming dude can rock and roll. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, let's take a look at the offensive line group. Uh, the offensive line group is, I think, interesting. I'm and I'll need you to sell me on some of these players. I've heard good things about some of them and some not bad things, but like maybe some questions about consistency. So um, Josh Fryer, who's a redshirt junior, who's played some obviously. Donovan Jackson, uh, a young guy, and Carson Henson, uh, Matthew Jones, and yep. then a, a a transfer in in uh, Joshua Simmons, yep. and then guys behind guys that are in the mix like uh, Jacob. J uh, sorry, yeah. Jacob, yeah, Jacob James, uh, Inoki, Vimea, um, Tegra, Tishabola, uh, Joshua Padilla, uh, Toby Wilson, Ken Mikulski, Scott Gee Jr., Trey LaRue, and Miles Walker are also sort of in the mix-ish, apparently. Uh, yeah. who, do you, who do you think sort of see the field? And then amongst the guys that are projected starters is the one that might lose his job. Sure. So, Miles Walker immediately you could cross him off the list. That guy's a freshman. Uh, I think he was a three-star recruit. Maybe the uh, he was he was either a really low four or high three. Again, he gets the Buckeye bump, so he was probably a three-star at one point. I think they got him out of Connecticut. That's a guy that checks a lot of the physical boxes, but is nowhere near ready to play. Um, okay. You know, Donovan Jackson and Matthew Jones. Those dudes are locked. Those dudes are are the dudes. Those dudes. Matthew Jones. I think. I think I don't know if he would have got drafted, but he would have definitely been in the NFL. He would be on an NFL roster right now if he wouldn't use his 60 yard this year. Donovan Jackson, I think he's going to be an early round pick. That guy's an absolute dog. Um, you know, you're talking about your left tackles. You talk about Josh Fryer. Um, I think that Tegra Shabola is going to be in that mix. Tegra Shabola is a four star kid out of Trotwood, I believe it was. Big, big, ginormous kid. Uh, he's got the he's got a Big Ten body already. If you watch his film, you know he's kind of a mauler. I don't want to compare him to Corey Stringer, but you know I love watching '90s Ohio State football. And he wow. He, I don't want to, That's not that's not an apt comparison. It's not really fair. But he's not to me. But he's but really he's, a big he's kid. Much bigger than everybody on the field. Right. He's a really big kid. Right. Yeah, there's two kinds of big ass blockers, right? There's the kind that makes you run around you, and then there's the kind that puts you in the ground. He's the kind that puts you in the dirt. So I wouldn't count him out. Um, Enoch Mahi, that's a guy I really liked. He was another five star recruit, uh, an armor all American kid. Um, I, I think he has a shot at winning the guard position, but I don't know what they're going to do with Matthew Jones. I don't know if they're moving Matthew Jones to center and then him play there. You know, there's a lot of noise about Jacob James at center. So we'll see about that. But I, I like Enoch Vamahi probably better than Jacob James. So I would try to work him in. Um, obviously, they have Victor Cutler as well, who's the transfer from Yul Monroe, who's a lot of people are kind of writing off. I wouldn't. I think that, you know, he was very okay at Yul Monroe. And, you know, if you got six months and uh, training in Ohio State is a lot different than training at Yul Monroe. And I don't think that he's it's not some, he's not a walk on by any means. So uh, he, he's got starting experience. So I wouldn't count him out. Carson Hensman is going to be fighting for a job, although I don't think he's going to be starting. Um, he's more of a guard type. Zen Mikulski, that's a guy that's probably going to get some starts to tackle. Before, I mean, he's going to get a shot. That's for sure. He's definitely going to get a shot. Uh, and then Ben Crispin is – I don't I don't know if he's – he's going to get a shot. He's going to be on the depth chart. I don't know if he's going to be the dude. I guess it's going to be between him and Mikulski at the other tackle spot. So that, that's kind of where you're at with Lyman. I – 
I'm not worried about it. Um, a lot of those guys are four, five star guys who just kind of didn't come into their own. Uh, you mentioned Simmons, the transfer. That guy's going to start immediately. That guy's they brought him in from he's a heavy hitting transfer. They worked really hard to get a transfer, and that's a guy. Um, he's that you know that's who they wanted. That's the guy that's going to fill in. So you got three linemen, Matthew Jones, Simmons, and Donovan Jackson, who are very, very good top echelon guys. And you got two guys that you're hoping can step up. And there's enough four or five star guys that have shown potential where that should happen. That's not my concern on offense, although that group does have its fair share of uh, question marks. Okay. Yeah, and that, that was – I'm going to say I thought it was a projected weakness, but I had some questions about the offensive line and offensive line depth. And it seems like there's two or three guys you really like and then some players that I thought are sort of in the mix and maybe one or two of them emerges. So that was – you answered that question beautifully. Uh, as you might remember, last year I had questions about the tight ends. Guess what? This year I have questions about the tight ends too, Josh. Um, so I'm going to throw some names at you. Um, I mentioned the old guy of the group, um, um, G. Scott Jr., uh, who is, I think, a senior, maybe even a fifth-year senior, if my memory serves. I'm not sure. Um, definitely but, a senior. I can't remember if he's true or redshirt, but he's definitely a senior. Yeah, that's what I was trying to remember. Uh, Joe Royer, and then I guess Cade Stover, who is also a redshirt. Or I, I know I know is a redshirt senior. He's been yeah. around for a while. Uh, as I guess Stover's a projected starter, but he seems like he might be the, the lowest upside guy of the group. But uh, once again, you would know better than I would. So Cade Stover is the dude. I mean, the K K Silver's an All American level. T- I mean, it would not surprise me if K Silver got some first round hype. Uh, that's a little, that's a little crazy. But with the <laughs> NFL usually the tight ends, whatever. He he's going to get All American. There's going to be some All American hype around him. Okay. You know, Ryan, neither Ryan, no Ryan Day nor Urban Meyer like to use their tight ends, and that's Correct. how good K Silver is. He's quiet. He shuts his mouth. He's ferocious. He's a great blocker. He does the dirty work. He goes out there. He's a smart player does what's needed to be done he does it at a very very high level and he's constantly improving he's going to be better this year than he was last year i can guarantee it kate stover is a man that's the dude you got g scott jr is going to be walking into the season as the backup he it was a former four star five star fringe guy all american high school american uh who was a wide receiver packed on some weight and then moved to the tight end he has not lived up to that that recruiting standard. He has made some silly mistakes, one against Michigan when he headbutted that guy, and he hasn't really – He he's one of those guys where, you know, I don't like – there's there's versatile and then there's tweener, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of a tweener because versatile would mean that he's making plays, and he's not making the plays that he needs to make. I like him, nice, you know, nice kid. There's potential there. He could certainly surprise me. But if it's me, I'm really thinking that, the, that they got a true freshman from – George and Jelani Thurman, and that dude is big, long, and I think he's ready to play Big Ten football. Hmm. Cade Stover's the guy. He is 100% the guy. But I think that you can certainly, if it's me and I'm Ryan Day and if Jelani Thurman's as good as I think he is, I would work it. I would have Cade Stover as your number one, but I would certainly work in Jelani Thurman because Joy Roy, Joe Royer and G. Scott, you know, I think that they're closer to the ceilings. G. Scott's going to be gone. Um, unless he takes his 60 year or whatever. Jelani Thurman's where it's at. I mean, you know, you get straight up Ricky Dudley vibes from watch. A big, long basketball t- player type body. I mean, he's he is a dude. He, this film is fun to watch, and I think he's ready to play Big Ten football. So that, I think by the end of the season, you're going to see that guy crack the 2D. Kate Stover's the guy, but I think Jelani Thurman's going to get some snaps. I really, truly do. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I think G. South Jr. should have grad, should grad transfer to like San Jose State or someplace and light it up. But um, but you that's not my job. Do you think uh, he's going to do that? I mean, I think that in the right situation, or maybe like Texas Tech or somebody, someplace where, one, they throw balls to tight ends, and two, where they don't care if he can block or not. But um, you talked about the running backs a, bit, a little bit right. The only question I have about Chip Trainum is maybe he should go back to playing linebacker. Uh, so, but it sounds like you, you, you're satisfied with talking about running backs. The only you didn't discuss that I've heard anything about is Dalen Hayden. So I guess I'll ask about him before we move on to the quarterback situation. So uh, what do you think of Mr. Hayden, and does he have a chance to see the field at all this year? I, I think he has to. Uh, like, you know, Tennessee was knocking on his door hard after the Michigan game because the Michigan game, they can't, Ohio State did, it was really weird. They went with Chip trying him, which is funny because I didn't even mentioned him when Brock was talking about his depth, the running back depth chart. But Chip is, a, you know, he's not great, but he's very good. And he's very fast. He's surprisingly quick for, you know, a guy that they were playing at linebacker at the beginning of the year. Um, So I think that he felt a little hurt that they went with Chip Trinum, and then they 
uh, we're rotating in Xavier Johnson, who's a wide receiver, walk on wide receiver. And he was sitting there going, well, you know, I just ripped off, you know, 80 yards against Wisconsin or whatever it was. Why am I over here on the sidelines? But they've mended that relationship. He shunned Tennessee. Uh, so I think he's got to get carries. And I think he's good enough to, to really – he is good enough. It's I think it's a lot like what I'm saying with Jelani Thurman. Travion Henderson and Mayan Williams are so good. There's nothing he's going to be able to do to unseat those guys. But he is good enough to where people are going to be like, that's a guy. That's a guy we're going to be set. Because I think he's really good, and I think he's shown he's really good. And SEC teams are knocking on his door to make him a feature back this year. So he's okay. kind of got, he's got a little bit of an old school feel feel to him too. Now I'm not good at comparisons because my biggest issue is that I'll watch like old Ohio State games, and then I'll turn on some high school tape and be like, oh, that guy looks exactly like the guy just saw. So I was watching old John Brockington tape, and he's just, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, and, oh. you know John Brock, John Brockington. No one ever talks about him in the ethos of Ohio State running backs, but he's one of the oh. best to ever do it. And, he, but, and it's, it's because he wasn't – if you watch his highlights, you watch his games, he wasn't sexy. It wasn't like Archie Griffin. or no. he, John Brockington was very much like, you know, the, that that Jim Otis type, right? Those kind of yes. running, backs, running backs that kind of get forgotten. We talk about the great – I'm going to give you a few to describe John Brockington. Blunt force trauma. Yeah. There, yeah, and there's, there's, there is a role for those guys. And they're just not sexy, but there is a role for those guys. There's a really there. If you can get hand the guy hand the ball off and a guy get five yards, that's a good. That's a that can be a running back. That's a starting running back. You know, John Brockington was a bad boy in Green Bay too before injuries affected him. So um, you know, that's not a bad comparison. It's not an insult at all. Yeah. Well, you were in my wheelhouse when you start talking John Brockington. Woo woo! Boy, boy, I oh, I'm all juiced up. I'm about, I'm about to like whip out some Lawrence McCutcheon tape next. Um, <laughs> You know, but uh, before we completely lose Brock, uh, let's turn to players who are not in their 50s and 60s. Uh, so you mentioned the quarterback situation. Uh, obviously, you talked about Kyle McCord, who is a not that young because he's been around for a while, but untested player. Yeah. Uh, Devin Brown is a redshirt freshman that people some people are high on. Uh, Lincoln Kleinholz is probably not going to play, but maybe I'm wrong. And the guy I've seen the most is actually probably the guy back up, you know, lowest on the depth chart is Tristan Grebia, who I've actually seen play when he was in at a a, a Beaver at Oregon State. So uh, why you grad transfer someplace to be a fourth or whatever stringer, whatever. But at least it's you know a cool place to be a fourth stringer. So uh, tell me about these quarterbacks, what you know about them, and is there anybody who's even a slight threat to Mister McCord? No, because Devin Brown, I, he when he got hurt. That was- the end of it pretty much. I, I, I strongly believe that. Devin Brown was the second guy. Devin Brown has a very high ceiling. You know, we're talking about comparisons. I, I don't want to compare again, I don't know why I do this, but his his if you want go back and watch his high school tape, it's very much like Dwayne Haskins where he runs when he needs to. He finds the right guy. He's a great, efficient distributor. Um so he had a shot to win that battle. But Kyle McCord stayed healthy through the spring. He's got a great rapport with Marvin Harrison Jr. They both went to the same high school. And Mar- and Kyle McCord does have a ridiculous arm. When C.J. Stroud was struggling uh, early on, you know, against Minnesota, and I don't want to say he struggled against Oregon, he threw one bad pass, but that pass was a big deal at the time. Um, I was sitting there going, "Listen, you know, we got three quarterbacks here. When we, when you were Kyle McCord, and there was another kid who transferred out to Florida, Jack Miller. I'm like, two of these kids are going to transfer. Let's put one of them in. Because if you watch Kyle McCord throw the ball in practice, the dude's ball is pretty." The dude throws a very pretty ball. It's it, he just does. So he uh, people Ohio State fans want to see Devin Brown, not necessarily because of Devin Brown's high ceiling, although he does have a high ceiling. It's more because they were not impressed with what Kyle McCord did last year against Kent State. I think that's who they played or Toledo. It was against Toledo, which I don't know why his stat line wasn't horrendous. It was just a very workmanlike, you know, lunch pail kind of effort, if that makes sense. So. But, but Kyle McCord is, is is more than capable of leading this offense, and I think that's your dude. Okay. And now we get to where there might be some actual problem areas, though there's one, you know, stud who's penciled in as a first-rounder. My questions are about the linebackers in secondary, uh, but let's talk about the defense, where if there is a weak spot, that's probably where it is. Uh, walk me through the defensive depth chart. I'm going to throw out, obviously, um, JTTMLO is – a beast. Uh, in the mix behind him are guys like Caden Curry and Amari Abor. Uh, and I guess in their particular system, they're asking some guys to two-gap, which is very old school of them. Uh, then you've got 
uh, on the nose, Ty Hamilton with guys like Taiwan Malone and Hero. First of all, all name team contender Hero come out. Then you've got uh, Michael Hall Jr., yeah. Tyleek Williams, uh, Will Smith Jr., and Jaden McKenzie sort of in the mix on the other side. And I'll start with them, and then we'll talk about their their uh, stand up pass rusher types, and then their true linebackers, and then the, then the secondary. Yeah, yeah. So so Will Smith Jr. and uh, uh, McKenzie, you can kind of cross off. Those guys are true freshmen. Will Smith right. Jr. You guys are probably already well aware of him, legacy guy from. Uh, I feel incredibly old because I remember when his, <laughs> yeah. his father was like seventeen years old coming in. So God, Jesus, yes. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, McKenzie's a, uh, another true freshman from uh, Glenville. He's got a, a Big Ten ready body, I think. I don't know. That's kind of hard to tell, really, because you don't really know how much they weigh. You know, you're just kind of watching and guessing. I don't think he, I don't think those guys are are uh, going to have a going to have a role as freshmen. Uh, but you know, you mentioned JT. It's going to be JT and Jack on the edges. I have no doubts about that. Both those guys got first round ceilings. Um, you've seen it with JT against Penn State. He's just got to do that more consistently. And Jack's the same way. Jack has flashes too. He just has got to, both those guys have to crank it up to eleven. Um, you know, behind those, uh, you know, Caden Curry. That was one of my favorite recruits coming in. Uh, and I thought I was being sly and smart having that as one of my favorite recruits last year. And everybody in Ohio State's beat said, "No, that's the dude. That's the dude." He, they, he got he got special team snaps before anybody. That's something you know. That's something I typically monitor. Is I try to pay close attention to like, okay, it's not only about the first freshman to see snaps on the offense or defense. Who's the freshman that throw that they're throwing out there on special teams? Because that might tell you something. And Caden Curry was that dude, high motor guy, guy you can move inside and out. You know, he he he's going to see some action. I just don't think he's going to start. Uh, Kenyatta Jackson, that's another guy who was a freshman last year. Um, his high school tape was really impressive. He bulked up, and um, all reports are good from him from spring. So I think that he's going to see some action too. That's probably your two deep. Um, Michael Hall and Tyreek Williams are going to be the interior guys again. Both those guys have first round height or first round talent. They really truly do. But just like everybody else on this Ohio State defense, they have to do it a hundred percent. Tylee Williams, they did this weird thing where they were playing for like three snaps a game. No one knows why. Everybody was asking, like, hey, is it is, that, is he out of shape? If he's out of shape, just sit. They're like, no, no, he's fine. He's out of shape. But he only got like three snaps. And then Michael Hall Jr., they kind of did a little bit of the same thing. Although Michael Hall was dealing with an injury. Well, Michael Hall, that if you we talked about your guys' play sheet breakout player that's my breakout player at a sprint he had the fastest 40 it's the fastest 40 i don't know they do this weird thing where they do like a speed test but i don't think they actually do a 40 times like miles per hour but he was the fastest one out of the entire defense at 280 pounds i mean the dude the dude is a beast got a quick first step you know the, his teammates will say oh Aaron, they call they call him aaron donald they say he's aaron donald huh. and some of his teammates will, will, will tell you up and down that he's the next aaron donald and if there are you know there are plays that look Aaron Donald-ish from last year. He's just got to – they just got to turn it up a notch. Um, you know, behind him, you mentioned Ty Hamilton. I don't think Ty Hamilton's going to start. I think he's going to be a rotational piece. And Hero Canoe is – Hero Canoe is also going to be a dude. That was a guy that they got in uh, another freshman last year. Um, he's got a Big Ten ready body. Um, he's 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 also going to be entering that rotation for sure. So I think that's your defensive line rotation. I'm not worried about the defensive line at all because, God, one of them – if you just have – Two of those guys, two of the four guys, if you have one of them reach all-American potential, because one of them should. I mean, realistically, they really should. I mean, both Jack Sawyer and JT were five-star, like one and two, defensive end one and two in their class. Like, this, just it, it would be insane for them for one of them not to reach that all-American potential. And the other guys just be solid. That's a damn good defensive line. And though he's technically a linebacker, you're talking about Jack Sawyer. He's, he yeah. says he has a stand-up pass rusher. So let's talk about that position. I think that's you mentioned right. You mentioned Kenjada Jackson. You mentioned Jackson. Any any chance that Michael, uh, I mean that uh, Mitchell Melton sees any time at all, or is he just a depth piece? He he's been he's been hurt. He's a guy that they always talk about like at practices, like oh he's in the gym, he's doing this. Um, you know he he. Do you remember that? Do you remember Terrell Hanks from New Mexico State with the big shoulders? I most certainly do. Yeah. He was, he was built like uh, Melton. He's built like that. He's built like like a like an action figure. So I, I you know the potential is high. The, I don't want to say the potential is high on him as in JT because we're talking about national stage height. But the potential for him to be a solid Big Ten player is there. You know very much like you know we talked about Michigan having Junior Colson 
Penn State, those guys. He can be on that level, but he's got to stay healthy. He, I don't think he's been healthy one year. He's been in Columbus, so I'm not putting my money in that pile. If that makes sense. God bless him. I hope he does. Um, but it's just you know, he hasn't been healthy at all, even less than Julian Fleming. Okay, got it. Um, and now we get to what was a sore spot when we talked last year: the pursuit yeah. linebackers, true linebackers, off the pick a term. Um, I decided to call them old school or true linebackers. Uh, last year, I told you I wasn't truly impressed with that group. You defended a couple of them and agreed that some of them were maybe not quite what Ohio State wanted them to be. Uh, let's look at them again. Tommy Eichenberg is back. Uh, Steel Chambers, all team, all name team, uh, strong candidate there. Uh, and then you've got guys like Cody Simon, C.J. Hicks, Gabe Powers, and uh, Reed Carrico, another cool name. All in kind of that mix behind them. Yeah. Who might emerge? And then amongst the more established players, do you think one of those guys ends up becoming a star? Yeah, Tommy Eichenberg. I, I think he got, honestly, I think he got snubbed out of All American status last year. I don't know what more the guy had to do. You know, he didn't, he basically didn't have any hands against Michigan and uh, was it Michigan State or whatever. Um, and he still racked up the tackles. I mean, he's, he's, he's your old school, ferocious run defender, but mm-hmm. he can also rush the passer. You know, uh, he's, he's, He's not just your typical good Big Ten linebacker. He's not, you know, Jay. When you talk about old school Big Ten linebacker, you talk about Jay Lehman and a bunch of guys that never made NFL rosters that were okay and racked up a bunch of tackles. No, he's good. He's going to have a good NFL career. Could he? He's, could he be like a Sean Lee type at the next level? I think so. I I, I think so. I, he, he's he's good, man. He's very maybe even better. Maybe even better because he's oh. he is good. He fills the hole. He's big. He's nasty. He's 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 quick. I don't want to say he's fast. I don't think he's going to be a combine star by any means. But he's quick enough to go sideline to sideline. And then Steel Chambers. Uh, my issue with him last year is that he and he kind of proved me wrong. He makes he makes the same mistakes that I was afraid of. But he was a guy that was a running back for so long, for so long. You know, and last year was really the first year you saw him play linebacker a whole you know, a whole season through, and he got better every game. Uh, I think he made an all-Big Ten team. I don't know if it was first or second team, but, you know, I, I only saw – there was a, only a couple instances where he would, like, bite on fakes or bite on a play action. But he's honestly – he's fast enough to where he can make up for a lot of that. He had one play where he bit off, like, a screen pump fake, and he still made the tackle. Actually, he didn't make the tackle, but he still was able to go outside. He was hustling, 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 and the running back juked him, but the running back had to he, – he forced the play – inside which is more than i i was expecting if you watch the beginning of the play um so that's you know kind of like darren lee darren lee was a little like that kind of ran you know because darren lee was quarterback in high school <laughs> ran around with his head on fire and got lucky every now and, then. and still chambers is like this you got another year where he's learned to play I, I like him too i think he's gonna be a high draft pick too i really do that's gonna be a guy that's gonna surprise the combine he has a lot of potential he's still learning the position the guys behind those, uh, behind them, is C.J. Hicks. C.J. Hicks, the former five-star linebacker. That's a guy very much like Dalen Hayden on the outside of the ball. That they have to give snaps. They have to give him snaps. He's too good to keep off the field because in the day and age of the transfer portal, he will be gone. And he is a very, very good linebacker. Very, very good. People, like you can't tell me people are knocking on his door trying to get him to transfer. So that's a guy you're going to see whether they like it or not. Cody Simon was another guy I really like. I got to spend some some time with him in the off season. Um, he, he's but he's another guy that's kind of been bitten by the injury bug. Uh, but my uh, my understanding, he's 100. percent He's ready to rock and roll. Um, and he was another former All American, high school All American. He bulked up. He looks good. Uh, I think that I, I had him as my all uh, on my All Big Ten team going into last season. And again, that was proven wrong because of injuries. I, I don't have him on my All Big Ten team this year because the high state doesn't play that many linebackers. And Tommy Eichenberg and Steeler are going to be your dudes. But Cody's going to enter in. I think he's going to enter into the depth. I think he's going to be rotated in. Um, Gabe Powers, I'm completely biased towards Gabe Powers. Gabe Powers is close to my hometown. Um, I got to watch him kind of grow up a little bit, and uh, I got to interview him a couple times. I don't think he enters into the fray quite as much as those other guys. Ohio State just doesn't play that many linebackers, so I don't think he's going to get a chance. That's another former four-star recruit. Reed Carrico, I think he's going to be a senior. Yeah, that was a guy that they got. I think he was a former four-star recruit that kind of just never got better, so I don't think he's going to see the field much. Got it. Okay. And the other place where I was concerned a bit last year and and concerned more this year, and maybe you can talk me into or out of some of these players, is the secondary. Um, Obviously, they have some guys that are expected to be good. 
Uh, Denzel Burke is back. Uh, Jair Brown is a person that I've heard a little bit of buzz about. Ryan Turner is a young guy. They've got Lathan Ransom, another all-name, maybe second-team all-name contender. Uh, Sonny Styles, another second-team all-name contender. Then you've got Kurt Williams the second, and then in the state um, you got Josh Proctor, who's another guy that we're fairly familiar with. Uh, Kyle Stokes, I've heard some things about. Uh, Malik Harford, I've, he's very young, but I've heard some things about him too. Maybe he might see the field a little bit, or maybe a special teamer. Um, Davison uh, Ibnunson is supposed to be in the mix, or maybe I guess a protected starter even. Oh, yeah. Jordan Hancock. Jermaine Matthews, uh, another young guy, Jermaine Matthews, and then the nickel uh, is uh, apparently going to be Cameron Martinez. But in the in the mix, you have guys like Ryan Turner and Jihad Carter. So walk me through that. Are there any legitimate battles uh, where somebody might move up or down, and what can I expect from the secondary in uh, Columbus? Yeah, this is the weak spot. This is, this is the weak spot. You have quarterback that's the weak spot on the offense because we don't know what we got. The defensive backs are a weak spot because they are a legitimate weak spot. It's just they, they were grabbing and on the, the transfer portal. They got Lorenzo Styles Jr. in here late to play, and they're moving him to cornerback. He started a wide receiver in Notre Dame last year. Right. Grab, they grabbed the safety from Syracuse. That, the, the safety from Syracuse, Jihad Carter and Eggman uh, son from the quarterback from Ole Miss, those were good grabs. Those were desperation moves. Those guys yeah. are going to start. Very good players. Sonny, Lawrence Stiles Jr., I, I think that, that was a little – he's good. I like him. There's a lot of athleticism. I, there, You know, there's some moves where you're like – it's kind of like Victor Cutler on the offensive line where you can tell that they live at the depth trend, so we got we to do something. Um, so, yeah, that's – that's this is, defensive backfield is their weak spot. The only guys that I would mark as 100% starters are Denzel Burke and Lathan Ransom. And even Wraith, Wraith Ransom, I say that with a little bit of hesitancy just because there's so much stardom behind him. Uh, you talk about the corners, Denzel Bur Burke, uh, and I think Eggman and Son are going to be your starters. I really don't think there's going to be much about that. Uh, Jordan Hancock and uh, Jair Brown are going to be right behind Jair, Jair Brown was a true freshman last year. Uh, he started a little bit due to some injuries, and he played really well. He played really well. He made some mental mistakes, but he, he's he he's got a little bit of Dane Ar Damon Arnett swagger to him where he <laughs> doesn't uh, – which you know, oh, that, be that, nice, Brock. Be nice. That's that's an insult now. But but he was you know, but Damon Arnett was always second fiddle to uh, Jeff Kuda, but he had a lot of swagger to him. He was very physical. Jared Brown's kind of kind of got that. Maybe lacks you know the speed um, and some of the check lacks some of the box that you want checked the number one corner, but certainly doesn't lack any in the second corner. Um, and Jordan Hancock, that's a guy that's kind of been in, bitten by the injury bug as well. But every year every year it goes by, and every year someone says he's got first round talent. So those guys are going to be fighting. Those guys are going to be compete with the transfer. But Denzel Burke, you can pretty much write that in stone. Um, at safety, they play three safeties. And like I said, I, I really feel strongly that Lathan Ransom is going to be the dude. I think your other two safeties are going to be uh, Sonny Styles and Jihad Carter. Jihad Carter, like I said, that, that guy was like all ACC. I don't know why you'd reach out to him and not play him. That doesn't make any sense to me. He's good enough to play in the Big Ten. He's shown it. That, I think that's going to be a dude. Sonny Styles, uh, he reclassified. He was supposed to be in this year's recruiting class, and he reclassified to join last year's recruiting class. That's another, uh, you know, Ohio State legacy, Dad's Lorenzo Styles. Um, yep. He's an absolute star. I, I think he's like 6'4", 220. He's, ga he's gained some weight this offseason. That dude's ready to rock and roll, and you can play him wherever you want. Safety linebacker, I don't care. Get him on the field. So I would lock that in, too. Whether he's a starter on opening day, he will be a starter by the end of the season. Um you, you mentioned Court Williams. Court Williams is another kind of, uh, I don't want to say tweener. I think he is versatile. This is another former four-star, five-star guy, uh, Army All-American guy. Again, bit by the injury bug. They kind of moved him around. Hey, you're going to play safety. Then you're going to play linebacker. You're going to play safety. You're going to play linebacker. This huh. year, I think he's going to be locked in a deep back. He's got a great safety body. He's very big for his safety, but he's got just, just, just as much speed. They're not moving him there because of any issues with him. Um, he's very good. He can be very good, but he's got to be healthy. He's got to be healthy. Uh, and then Josh Proctor, uh, he's coming back for his sixth year. There's a lot of experience there. I was once high on Proctor, but I don't want to – I'm not going to keep that money in that pile, if that makes sense, right? Time has kind of passed. Um, I think he can do some things. Um, I just – I don't know if he is has lived up to that former four-star, five-star feeling that he had. And the other guy you mentioned was Kai Stokes. Kai Stokes is kind of an underrated recruit. Uh, he, he enrolled early last year, made some huge noise all spring 
last year. He was an absolute star in the spring game. Um, he didn't really see the field much last year, but that wasn't his fault. I think there was just depth. Guys got healthy, um, all that. This year, I think he's going to be more of a factor. I don't think he starts, but he's definitely going to be in, in the rotation. He's going to be more of a factor. Um, those other guys you mentioned, Jermaine Matthews and um, Malik Harford, those guys are a bit too young, I don't think, to see the field. Um, maybe Jermaine Matthews. Jermaine Matthews has got some serious speed, some serious speed. He's got good size, good length. But he played – He played. I think he from like North Carolina, South Carolina – if you go back and you watch his high school film, there's definitely a difference in what he's dealing with. So I think that even if he checks all the physical boxes, I don't think he's going to be mentally ready. I mean, that that was a guy – I mean, shoot, dude, he probably had – I mean, that was a guy – he was returning punts for them, and he was doing the – no, 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 yes, 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 please. That was in his – I mean, that was all he did That was because he broke 85 tackles of play. So I don't think that guy's ready for this kind of step up. Uh, but Malik Harford, that was the guy who uh, – his play went viral when he knocked the crap. And uh, some wide receiver going over the middle. I think it's Troutwood. He's an Ohio boy, but I don't think he's ready for the Big Ten. Either. Got it. Right now. Um, we touched on a lot of the top recruits. I just want to see if there's any others that we need to talk about before we move into the season itself. Uh, yeah. Brandon obviously got discussed, um, and you compared him to some really good football players. Uh, Noah Rodgers got discussed. You compared him to some really good football players. You mentioned that uh, Carnell Lake is the guy you really like. So it looks like more of the same at the wide receiver position. Uh, Jermaine Matthews is a guy you, you made mention of a little bit amongst uh, corners. Calvin Simpson Hunt's a guy that I've liked a little bit when I watched him on tape. And now we're getting to guys that really haven't come up yet. Guys like Jason Moore, I guess they're going to try to put some more weight on him and maybe he'll end up playing tackle. I don't know. Uh, Jelani Thurman is a guy that might someday be a starting tight end for you, I guess. Uh, Luke Montgomery is probably a future starting guard. I'm interested in Joshua Mickens, so I, I hope you'll have some things to say about him. Uh, we briefly touched on Malik Hartford, and you say he's not quite ready. Arbel Reese is another guy I think someday could be a starter for you and maybe grows into yeah. being a jack linebacker when his body fills out. We talked about Kai Holtz a little bit. He said he's a guy that needs to develop. We talked about Will Smith Jr., once again, a field old moment for me. Uh, Kane McDonald, uh, Austin Sierveld, Cedric Hawkins, Bryson, uh, Roger. We did talk about Miles Walker already. So amongst those guys that we didn't already talk about, is there anybody you think might actually do something this year? Jason Moore. I know that the, uh, you're, you're right. There's been murmurs about him moving to the interior. I don't think you have to move him towards the interior. He's got a very uh, Joey Bosa feel to him where he oh. just – He's long enough. I don't. I don't think he's ever. There's this. There's this giant focus on on where you want in defensive ends. They're all like JT and Chase Young to have that elite first step and be pass rushers. I I think if you want to play him at defensive end, he can do that in the Big Ten right now, and he's got the power and the strength oh. to do that. Um, uh, you know, I, I've talked to some people that live out in that area, and they say he's every bit of six foot six two eighty. So I, I, you know, that, and that's how he plays. That's how he plays. And I think that that, if that's really his size, I think that translates well to the big 10 and that translates well to this depth. You know, I know the, the depth chart for the defensive line is, is stacked, but man, that's a guy that I really, really like watching. I really like watching him play. Um, so that, that's definitely a dude there. You mentioned uh, Luke Montgomery, the, the tackle for Finley. That's a really athletic kid. I don't, Lyman, I have not quite got the gist of, of watching Lyman in, in high school. Like I said, I really like Tegra Shabola when he was coming out because he dominated Deuce to the point where he was basically teabagging him like a 13-year-old in Call of Duty. It was like, oh, yeah, that guy won that round. But some of these guys, it's harder to do that because, you know, they have quick feet, but they're not dominating or, you know, it's hard to project their ceiling because you don't know how their bodies are going to develop. Luke Montgomery's kind of like that. Uh, that was a kid who played on – he played on, like, LeBron James's kid, the kid's team in basketball. He was getting recruited as a basketball player for the longest time before he made the switch to, like, okay, only focus on football. Very athletic, quick-footed kid. I just don't know if he has the size and strength to play in the Big Ten right now, and I don't know how long. He, he to me, seems like a guy that might be, like, uh, you know, a junior player, senior player, uh, maybe a guy like – I'm trying to think of another Ohio State guy, the Pat, like Corey Lindsley. That was a guy who was a very good deep offensive lineman, very good offensive lineman, but he didn't start until, like, his third year, right? That That's kind of what I see with Finley. Um, you mentioned Mickens. I can't remember who I compared Mickens to. A lot of people were very psyched about Mickens. I think that there was a lot of hype around him. I think there was more hype around Mickens than guys like Jason Moore because he was going to LSU for so long 
that the hype just was surround. You know, when he switched, it was like, oh my God, it's it's Christmas. But it, to me, the defensive lineman in this class that's ready to play sooner rather than later is Jason Moore. Mickens is I don't I don't think he's I don't think he even weighs over two twenty five. So he, I don't think that guy's ready to play in the Big Ten. But I, I could be wrong. You know, maybe he maybe they move him to linebacker. Maybe they maybe I'm wrong about his weight. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm trying to look for guys that might be able to play sooner rather than later. Calvin Simpson, Hunt, that's a guy that I really liked out of Texas. Uh, I was pretty excited when they got him. That was kind of a, one that went kind of under the radar. I think it was because he was, he was verbal to Texas Tech and Baylor for a while. Um, but I really like him. I really like his play style. I think when him and Jermaine Matthews, as they grow older, that's going to be a pretty devastating pair. But, again, I don't, I don't think that that's a guy who's ready to play just yet. Got it. Understood. So um, now I want to take a, a – Quick look at um, other other transfers um, that didn't go to Ohio State, but you, that might make an impact. And then I want to talk about the season, you know, as a whole. So I'm going to give you some players that have changed teams coming to the the Big Ten, and yeah. which of these do you believe might do something? Uh, so I'll start with uh, not too far away. Uh, Indiana got Taven Jackson from um, Tennessee who is Tracy Jackson Davis's uh, younger brother, redshirted his first year at Tennessee. Do you think he might do anything? And if, do you know anything about him that makes you feel like he might have a chance to make an impact? You know, it's funny. You, in your, in your pregame sheet, you asked for, like, the, the most underrated, the worst, the best transfer classes. Yes. And I, I kind of marked – they all – the Big Ten did a really good job in the portal. I kind of marked Indiana as, as one of the worst because I feel like they took – Taven, I don't know what Taven Jackson can do, but he's gonna be he's gonna start. That's their dude. That's very, 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 very clear that that's gonna be their dude. And I don't know. There's not a lot at Indiana other than I mean they got some huh. decent running backs. Um, you know, I, I there's some it, you know it's it's Indiana. There's like you know a couple fast dudes that are five foot five, and then a wide receiver who's six foot three that catches everything but can't. <laughs> he runs a forty at five seconds. So I don't know if that I don't know if you want to throw in. You know, a first-time starter and that kind of, and, and expect good things from that, right? I could see that going pretty south. I could see his confidence getting, getting, uh, you know, destroyed. Indiana also brought in a wide receiver from Fordham, I believe. Yep. And then a defensive end from Western Michigan. The kid from Western Michigan is the most productive. I don't think there's anything you can do about that. That guy's going to be pretty okay. But all those guys, it seems like such a big leap where it's like, man, I don't really know. I, I, you know, Indiana is so bad. I don't know if any of those guys are going to have a very positive experience because, you know, when you go to a new place like that and things go south, it's really hard for you to bounce back, especially if you're a quarterback. So I think he starts. I think he sees a lot of playing time, but I don't think you're going to see a, you know, a tag of Iowa at Maryland kind of situation where that, you know, you just explode on the scene as one of the best Big Ten quarterbacks for half a decade. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, so. Um, depending on how you feel about Tommy DeVito, it was very good news, very bad news, when Tommy DeVito was denied his appeal for yet another year of eligibility. Uh, so uh, Luke Altmaier, who, of course, we got to see a little bit at Ole Miss, is now the projected starter at Illinois. What do you know about him? What do you think of him? I think that's a good pickup. I, you know, he's not – I mean, I don't. Want, it's not. It's not like the Spider Man meme. He's better than Tommy DeVito, but <laughs> but that. But that. But it doesn't. It doesn't matter because Illinois get. I think he is good enough to do what they need to do. If that makes sense. Um, yep. I, I think that Illinois. I, I think that in Illinois is going to come back down to earth a little bit. I don't expect them destroying the Big Ten. Um, I don't expect it to be his fault, but I definitely don't hit, expect him to elevate the play of Illinois. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, it, it sounds really stupid to say, but like a guy, a quarterback in the conference that I think can elevate the offense somewhat is Cade McNamara, who went to Iowa from Michigan. And it's not because he's good; it's just because that's a good fit. Because Iowa's quarterbacks, where sometimes it's not about how good a player is that's coming in. Sometimes it's about okay, how big of an improvement it is. And the, the Iowa quarterbacks were just so they were so bad. I know you guys watched the CFL too. I'm sure uh-huh. you saw Taylor Corn Dog last night throw that pick yeah. as he's getting sacked. You know what I'm talking about? They got picked the second. That, that's every Iowa quarterback in the last yeah. four years. So, Kate McNamara is not well, – Longer than that. You can go back further than that. Who's the guy that played for the Lions with the first-round pick? Long? There's been a few of them. Um, Chuck I mean, Long, right? Adzi, uh, I mean, Iowa go. has not exactly been a quarterback factory. No. Chuck Long was really highly rated and looked great in college. He didn't exactly work out. In the, yeah, I mean, that's, they're not a QB factory. 
Really? Really? CJ Beathard wasn't the QB. There you go, Ricky, CJ. Right there. Ricky, Ricky Stanzi wasn't that dude. <laughs> Stan, Stan Petras wasn't that dude. That's crazy. <laughs> oh, Petras. I was high on Petras. What? <laughs> for, about, for about six months, I was high on Petrus. I'm like, that guy's gonna be the. Were dude. you on crack for those six months? There was, there was him. There was I was high on. There was a Minnesota quarterback that was high on for like two seconds too. Oh, Tanner Morgan. No, it was the guy. Oh, no. Morgan. The no, kid I, I, I know. I know who you're talking about because I was high on him too, and it made me. He could. Stupid. He could run. He was like a he gazelle. Could, yeah, he was mobile. Yeah. Oh, jeez, oh, what was his name? And I was relatively high on Rocky Lombardi at Michigan State too. So that's, oh, yeah, that's kind of oh okay. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't go that far. The cool name? You like the school name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, Kate, the Iowa quarterbacks were so bad that Kate McNamara is gonna. It's gonna be like I don't know, man. It's gonna be like putting in Baker Mayfield after showing guys where it's like, whoa, oh, this guy's so good. It's like he's not really that good. It's just it's a good <laughs> Well, but that's I what mean, they need, right? So that, that that's probably if you ask. It's what I call the magic of lowered expectations. Yeah, so, yeah, and I think that's and that's fine. I'm not bashing him as a, it's college football, right? You don't need the guy. You just need someone to do his job, and they didn't have that. And now they exactly. have someone that could do that. So that's probably I mean, that's the Big Ten transfer quarterback that I feel probably has the biggest chance to impact that team. I mean, Iowa doesn't have you know an offensive coordinator that can do his job or a head coach that can treat players with respect and you know fairness or you know a culture that you know doesn't cultivate abuse. On a daily basis, or a <laughs> program that didn't have a strength and conditioning coach for 20 years that would call African American players the N word, or you know, having a program that could actually live, ex- you know, live to expectations instead of continuously faltering beneath them, lowering the expectations so much that when they finally go above it, they think they're the next coming of Jesus just to lose in the Rose Bowl. But you know, that that's neither here nor there when it comes to the Iowa Hawkeyes program. Um, yeah, I don't know why that set me off, but wow. Yeah, man. Huh. man, Iowa sucks. Okay, well, on that happy note, I'm going to ask about another Iowa transfer. Uh, I guess he was a package deal with Kate McNamara, Eric Ollie. Uh, yes, Eric Ollie from Michigan. Tell me what you think he might do he's in a tight end friendly offense. He's a bad dude. He's good, man. That's what I, Iowa, Iowa probably did the best at the transfer portal for the, if you look at the Big Ten as far as like actual impact guys that have a good resume. Eric All was the dude. This was a guy that I thought that I mean, this was a guy was dangerous in Michigan, and he got hurt. And this isn't a guy that lost a spot. And it is like McNamara. McNamara lost his spot, right? There's no getting around. It. Eric Hall didn't lose a spot. He got hurt, and then he got buried. It happens, right? But that's a dude. I think he's going to be. He's going to make some noise enough to get uh, to be a relatively high draft pick. I, I think he. I think he also elevates the offense, and he elevates the offense not because the tight end position is so bad there, because Luke Lachey is very good. Um, but he's that good. I think he's a really, really good receiver. I bought stock in him. There was a, a local. There's a, I, I do memorabilia, as you can see, in a local shop up in Toledo. I know the owner. He had a bunch of Eric Hall Michigan jerseys, and he was like, "Dude, you want?" I mean, so I bought it. I bought some for like twenty bucks a piece because I'm expecting him to blow up. I really, truly am. He's a huh. good tight end. He's a good tight end in an offense that caters to the tight end. And then yep. they had. I will also add a Nick Jackson. They added the linebacker who was very, very productive in Virginia. Very, very good at Virginia. So that, those, he's going to step into a line, to a defense that's already very good. That's going to allow him more freedom. I, I mean, that I would did a hell of a job on the transfer court. I really, they got three guys that are going to elevate those respective positional groups. I think. Okay, um, I want to hit on a couple more transfer portal things in order to talk about the actual schedule. So there is that, um, and of course, more than ever before, I'm seeing players transferring, of course, within the conference. But I'm going to step outside the conference for a moment and talk about Maryland. Now, Maryland had some really good receivers last year, and almost all of them are gone. Yep. Uh, because Jacob Copeland, Dante Demas, and Rakeem Jarrett are all gone. Caden yep. Prather uh, came in from West Virginia. I'm hearing a lot of good things about him. And I know Deshaun Jones and Curry uh, Deitches are also there in the mix. But I'm hearing that he may actually end up being the top target of the three. Uh, what do you hear? What do you know? Yeah, no, I you you in your pregame sheet you asked for the best, worst, and most underrated. Maryland's got the most underrated transfer class by far. I I, I no one's talking about it. They added, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, I, I got a little my little little pick and scratch over here, but they added four, three or four guys that are going to start immediately. And Prather's one of the dudes. Prather again, that's a guy who was in a very competitive. He, 
the the Big Twelve is a competitive. It's not like we talked about with Indiana. Where you're grabbing a guy from Fordham who's playing guys like me, right? No, he played at West Virginia and he had over 500 yards receiving at West Virginia. And now he's going to go to Maryland, who I think has got an upgrade as far as their off how their offensive structure. And Mini Tua Tag is a very good quarterback. He's a very good quarterback. He's been there for 35 years. So he's got more than enough. <laughs> he's, 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 a really, he's a good quarterback that can dish the ball. And then they've improved the offensive line when they got the kid from Frostburg State. And again, that may be I, I know I'm going, I'm kind of contradicting myself because that's a leap that's a D2 school, but that's a kid that was invited to the senior bowl, right? That was a kid that yep. was getting NFL draft hype, right? And he played off the tackle at Frostburg State. He was an all-American for multiple years. That's a guy that at the worst case is going to be an all-conference level guard. Right, yep. worst case yep. scenario, you've immediately improved that, and then they grab two defensive linemen. Right, they got the kid from Tennessee, the former four star that they missed out on the first time to play end or no defensive tackle, and they grab the defensive end. So they got two defensive linemen. I can't remember where the other kids from. You know what I'm talking about? I know you're talking about. Um, give me a second, I'll tell you who it is. I think I, if I, if we're, if we're thinking of the same person, I think we are. Uh, let me see. It's probably Phillips is a defensive tackle because he's from Tennessee. Yeah, hold on. I'll t- yes, okay. We are thinking of the same person. I'm, um, the name will be. Oh, hold on. Give me a second. Oh, I know you're talking about. Um, and he's a, a got a he's got a NFL body on him. Um, you're, yeah. you're about, you're about Jordan Phillips. Yep, yeah, yeah, that they got him from Tennessee, and then they got Donnell Brown at defensive end from another like Division two school or FCS school. But the guy was uber productive. You got the, I, the every player that they got is going to start, and that and that's a team that's not bad. I think what I think Maryland is going to be good. That's the difference between getting transfers in at a place like Maryland and Indiana is that they had good structure. They got enough. They got they picked enough productive guys, enough guys with you know question marks that have high high ceilings. To go with a program that's already pretty solid. Maryland dishes the ball. Maryland's not bad. Maryland's a very good team. Indiana's not good. So you bring in the guys, a bunch of guys that might not be good. So what do you got? Indiana sucks ass. Quote by Josh Keeley. During the COVID year, I thought that this was this was Indiana football. We're seeing a resurgence, and that's not what happened. He let Mega Penix walk, and things went south. And I just I don't see how he's going to recover. I want to touch on just a couple more, and then I'm going to walk through the actual uh, Big Ten schedule. Sure. So, um, I Michigan lost some people, also gained some people. Uh, AJ Barber comes in from Indiana. Uh, I don't know what you think of him. I'll in fact I'll sort of group these together. Uh, Nathan Carter goes from UConn, which is, of course, one of the worst programs I saw last year. But he makes his way to Michigan State, which could end up being a good thing for him. Maybe not quite to the level of what happened to, say, Kenneth Walker III. But I could see. But he was productive, though didn't play as much as he should have, in my opinion, at UConn, which is odd because they were bad. Uh, Elijah Spencer makes his way from uh, Charlotte, which is called UNC Charlotte back in my day, uh, to Minnesota. And then I will talk about a really big name in a second. So let's talk about those guys' group. A.J. Barner to Michigan, Nathan Carter to Michigan State, Elijah Spencer to Minnesota. So the, to me, the biggest Michigan recruit was, was Nugent from Stanford. Because oh, they, yeah. I mean, in my, in my opinion, because that was, you know, that's a team that relied. I, I, don't, I don't know what my expectations would be. I don't, I don't think that the, that, he changes the expectations of Michigan. I think that Nugent does. I think that new, you know, that was that to me was a, a positional group that I had circled. It's like ah, I'm licking my lips because oh, the Michigan's gonna be so bad, and then they grab that guy who was all Pac-12 last year, and he's just gonna yeah. be a play guy. Yeah, so yeah. That- Henderson, Henderson is the, the expected to, to start at left tackle, and I, I think he might be second team All Big Ten, but you know, you would know better than I would. Well, Drew, Nugent's gonna be the center, right? Right. right. And and Henderson's gonna be the left guard, I believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, to me, that's. And then they got Zach Center. They got Zach Center on the other side. So me, me, to, to me, grabbing Nugent uh, was probably the, the the biggest one. I mean, AJ Barner. I mean, that's a good pickup. Everybody keeps talking about him. Um, but you know, I, I think that they got guys like that. That makes. Sense. I don't know if he elevates elevates them. Nugent does. Okay, 
Um, now I'm going to talk about Eric Gilbert. Uh, big time recruit, obviously. Was expected to do great things. Yeah. Did not much um, for various reasons. Finds his way from Georgia to Nebraska. And Nebraska is sort of like the Eric Gilbert of universities in that there were a lot of expectations for them. And it never quite came together. So it's a perfect marriage of, um, once again, frustrated expectations. What do you think he does for Nebraska this year? I think he's great. So for, for, there was a school in the middle there too, right? Oh, um, well, we we touched a little bit. We didn't touch a little bit. Um, but I did mention Nathan Carter transferring to Michigan State, yes. Well, I meant, I meant Eric Gilbert transferred. There, it, went, it went Georgia, and then there was another school in the middle, and then Nebraska, right? Um, was there? He talked about Florida. Well, he tried to transfer to Florida. In fact, he tried. So he started at LSU before he got to Georgia. Oh, I mean, that's, that's, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then apparently, I, 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 maybe Florida maybe. thought they had him, and then they didn't have him. Maybe it's just me, like, not letting it go. But I, I like him. If it's me, if I'm Nebraska, if I'm Matt Rule, I'm revolving the whole offense around him. You got two quarterbacks to choose from in Jeff Sims uh, and, and uh, Thompson. And you, you got Eric Gilbert, who's athletic enough to, to realistically play wide receiver and also big enough to, to line up in line. I mean, I would revolve my offense around him. I mean, Nebraska's revolved their offense around worst players in the past. Um, they're not going to be good this year. Just, I don't I don't think it's possible. Usually his name Martinez, but yes, correct. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Matt Roy and then uh, the, Sp the Spielman kid, too. The Spielman kid was, was one of those classic good college football players where it's like, why are they – is that all you have? Do you remember that? Spiel? You know, like the Big Ten's leading receiver for like five years. You're like, what's going on here? Yeah. But uh, Eric Gilbert, you know, I, Nebraska's not going to be good. And I don't think that's Matt Rule's fault. I think it's a great hire. I think Nebraska's going to be competing with the Big Ten championship in three years. But this isn't the year. And Eric Gilbert is is a stud. I think he's a stud. I think he has a real chance to to make I, – I think he has a chance to make a couple touchdown grabs that are going to win them some close games. I think he's a dude. I think he's going to get drafted relatively high. Okay. That's bold, but quite possible because he is the talent is there. No one questions the talent. So um, only the existence of the aforementioned Mr. DeVito kept Northwestern from maybe maybe the hardest to watch uh, quarterback play in all of the conference. And they started three different players, none of whom really did anything. So now Ben Bryant, who is of course a kid from the northwest suburbs of Chicago, yeah. Lane Township High School, where I, Lions Township High School, I actually saw him play a little bit comes home after struggling to fill, you know, Derek Desmond Ritter's rather large shoes. He, as you said, he may not be good, sort of like we talked about um, the Iowa situation, but he'll be so much better than what they had that people will, will enjoy it. And, of course, we don't know who's going to be coaching Northwestern, but at least they have a quarterback. Uh, so tell me what you – yeah. Yeah, he's going to be – they told him he's going to be finished the season this year, right? Uh, coach? Yeah, sort of, I guess. But um, I mean, kinda. But yeah, um, talk talk me talk to me about or, or walk me through what you like or dislike or what you think of Mr. Ben Bryant. I think that's a good in the Northwestern. The Northwestern is going to be terrible. They're always terrible, and you know, not always terrible. But they're they're just they're going to be terrible. They got all this stuff going on. They're just going to be bad. But there's a difference between being unwatchable and being you know, Northwestern last year. And I think that Ben Bryant is a good step in that direction. I think Ben Bryant is a very solid quarterback. I liked, liked him. Uh, again, like you said, I, he's he's not terrible. He's kind of – but I also like the, the kid that they got from South Carolina who sucked. So, <laughs> I think it's Holinsky. So, I thought – Holinsky, Ryan right, Holinsky, yes. Yeah, so a I thought – heart, heart, Heart-touching story with his older brother, Tyler, and all that good stuff. Yeah. I, I apologize. Yes. No, no, no. But, you, no, you have to apologize. I mean, tape is tape. Um, right. Yeah. The public. I mean, we, we can feel for the family and 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 be and admire his courage and still yeah. not like what he did yeah. while he's playing. Yes. But I thought what made the situation differ for Ben Bryant and Northwestern this year, and again, all this is up in the air now that uh, Fitzgerald, Pat, Pat Fitzgerald's gone. But uh, you know, they, they got AJ Henning in, who was the, the dynamic speedster from Michigan, who I can't believe they let walk because I think yep. that dude. Yeah, real talent as we saw against ohio state um so you know you have a wide receiver there they got a transfer wide receiver from uh it was some he was very productive somewhere i can't remember what it was and then they got this kid a fringe three four star kid from right down the road that no one really wanted his last name's kobe who i guess lit it up in the spring 
So I feel like the offense, at least before, again, everything was up in the air, was trying to make a move towards being more reliant on the pass than the run. I think they had a Northwestern is one of those teams where I thought they had a really good recruiting class. Um, you know, there was a couple guys that I marked down from Ohio uh, that I thought were good plan B's for Ohio State. Uh, they, Ohio State didn't need them, but Northwestern went out and snagged up those guys. They got, you know, three or four guys I think can be immediate players. Uh, so Northwestern is going to suck this year. But my point is, is I think that the Ben Bryant, AJ Henning, um, that Kobe kid, there's, I know, I know there's another transfer wide receiver that came in too. The offense has a chance to step forward and at least pay the pay the way. Um, you know, I, I think I don't you're, have, I think you're talking about Cam Johnson, who was at both Vanderbilt and Arizona State at various points. Yes, yes, and that, and he's not great, but he's productive. Kind of, you know, he's just like everybody else, right? You know, he's Northwestern. Northwestern isn't going to get a guy that was a star at Arizona State. They're not, but they can go get a guy who got 500 yards in the Pac-12 and make him. And he was going to be the number two wide receiver behind AJ Henning, I think, yep. or you know, vice versa. Um, and that's a pretty okay receiving core. Again, Northwestern's not going to be good. If they didn't win a game in the Big Ten, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but that offense should at least take a step forward. I could see what they're trying to do. I guess is the point, if that makes sense. So I'm going to knock off the last few guys, and then we just look at the schedule, and then we can give you your life back. Um, so here's one of my favorite transfer guys, and Dante Cephas makes his way from the MAC, gets on the um, what highway would that be? They take you from Kent to Penn State. I don't know. You you would probably know that I better than I would which highway to get on. Whatever highway you hop on to get from there, hopped on it and takes his 82.7 receiving yards per game with him, and I think he might put up roughly the same numbers at Penn State, even though he might be, might not be the number one receiver. Um, Britton Strange is gone. Parker Washington's gone. There's room in that offense for what I think Dante Cephas is. So we'll throw him together with Hudson Carter, who makes a break from Texas to Purdue. And here's one of my favorites. Now, he's an older player. I think he's going to turn 24 and a half before they kick off the first game. But Nassim Brantley started his career at Sacred Heart, then transferred, where I got to watch him more at Western Illinois as a leatherneck. And he was terrific. At West Illinois, and he's a big body receiver. Got he's sort of like um, a slower version of Kenny Galladay. If you want a guy that sort of reminds me, he makes his way to Rutgers, Wisconsin, where okay, Brock's gonna laugh, but Wisconsin, where you know, quarterbacks tend to go to, with the exception of Russell Carrington Wilson, go to play like Wisconsin quarterbacks. But here's what I'll say about here's what I'll say about Tanner, here's what I'll say about Tanner Mordecai. Tanner Mordecai a, was a former pharmaceutical rep, right? Who, when they changed the uh, when they changed the regulations about um, uh, extra, what do you call it, uh, eligibility, said, "Oh, I get to play more college ball. Sure, why not?" Another guy who I think may be turns twenty five um, around the time the season ends, but started his career at Oklahoma, then went to SMU, has almost eight thousand, seven thousand nine hundred forty something yards passing in his career at SMU now makes his way to Wisconsin. Uh, yeah. Of those guys, uh, Mordecai, who I just talked about, Nassim Brantley, who you may or may not have seen, but I'm a big fan of, Hudson Card, Dante Cephas. Um, who, who do you, what do you know? Who do you like? And what do you think? who do you think makes an impact? Yeah, Cephas was a good I can't believe I didn't bring up earlier. But, yeah, that's a guy. You know, I watch a lot of Mac football being in Ohio. I bet on a lot of Mac football. Um, <clears throat> you know, yeah. so Cephas was, was a dude last year. Yep. And like you said, the offense is – he, he, I don't know if he's going to have the stats he had at Kent State, but I think that he is good enough to make. He's kind of like, because in my in my eyes, the, the wide receiver there is going to be Keandre Lambert Smith. That's going to be their number one. Yes, right? he he is good enough to be the number two. I, if you yep. do remember way back in the day when Ohio when Penn State had uh, the last name was Williams, he was number three, and he was recruited as a cornerback, and they moved to wide receiver, and he would, he'd always have like one oh, catch yeah, every, yeah. that was like seventy five yards. Do you remember what I'm talking about? I know exactly what I'm talking about. I his name, too. Uh, I can't oh. remember his name. Deion Williams or something like that. But that, no, like but that. that's, yeah. that's, that's kind of the D, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that, that's the kind of impact I think he could have. Someone that's not going to win all the accolades or all Big Ten, but in ten, you know, Penn State fans are going to remember him in 10 years, right? Uh, but, yeah, the Penn State offense, man, uh, you know, it's just it's just overflowing with talent. I mean, they still got Theo Johnson and, and Tyler yep. Warren, and uh, even their backup running back, that Allen kid, is, is really good. Um, but I, I don't think it matters. Cephas is good enough to where he's not going to be out of place. Um, Hudson Card was a big gift for Purdue. 
Um, I've talked to a lot of people that are closer to that situation than I, and they're very excited for him. They're, they think that he's going to be very good. Um, but the problem I have with that is that I don't think Purdue's going to be good. I think that they're going to mm. have – they got a new coach coming in, um, and I, I – I just I don't I don't think that the opportunity is there for him to to thrive. I think he's just going to be kind of a in and out kind of kind of solution, just something to make them not terrible, if that makes sense. Uh, but Tanner Mordecai, I mean, to Wisconsin, that was again. I, I don't I think Wisconsin is going to be Wisconsin's going to be good. I, I think that they got a chance to be in the Big Ten championship this year because um, that West Side is so wow. weak. Well, that West Side that West Side's relatively weak. Um, like I said, I think Ohio State smashes them, but I think that they can smash, you know, the teams like Northwestern, Purdue, Illinois, Nebraska. They're they're talented enough to do that. They still got Braylon Allen, and now that Phil Longo's there, they're going to be switching that. Matt, Mordecai is the answer. Mordecai is similar in the fact to Hudson Card, where he's going to be the stepping stone to make that offense what they need it to be, and he is talented enough to help that offense get there. You know, Hudson Card, he may have the talent to do it, but Purdue, the talent around him is bad. Mordecai is stepping into a situation – or at least they have Braylon Allen and they have a very good offensive line, right? That's that's two of the four things you have on offense. So I that that would probably be my Cephas, Mordecai, and then Card, I guess, would be my rankings. Okay. Um, and now we, I'm going to just let's talk schedule. So um, first, I guess week zero, uh, whatever you call it, Nebraska faces Minnesota. I'm assuming you see Minnesota winning that game, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think that, yeah, yeah, probably pretty handily too. What's the spread on? Do we know? Do we know the spread on that game? Uh, I can find out. Usually, usually uh, I'm pretty good about writing it down. That's what I was checking for, but I guess I didn't. But yeah, I, I think you're right. I think because I, I think Minnesota, you know, I don't think DJ Flex a horrible coach. I think there's still some talent there. Chris Bell <laughs> comes by. Um, you know, I, I, Matt Rule is as much of a good hire as I think he is. You can't work magic. So yeah, I would take Minnesota all day. Wow, that was that was a backhanded compliment. To PJ, I'll, I'll, I'll think you're entirely trash, but you know well, you, you, you are know. you all right. Yeah, P, PJ. They basically Minnesota's reverted back to uh to Glenn Mason with PJ Fleck. That's not a bad thing considering it's the Golden Gophers. I mean, let's yeah, not yeah. forget that Minnesota is very to look bad. Up. Yeah, I got I got I got Minnesota like seven and five this year. So like that's <laughs> seven and five. This is a team. I, I'm not calling 2020 because that was a so. Year so depending upon who you ask, it's either um, Nebraska's getting either seven, seven and a half, or eight. In case you're wondering, and, and I, I, don't think, five, I don't think they're five, under five, the 46 and a half. And I think I, I don't think it weeks. matters. I would take I would take Minnesota probably seven and a half sucks, but I I would still take Minnesota. No problem at all. Team averaging okay, nine, ten wins a season. Who Minnesota? Yeah, you say PJ Fleck is all right. <laughs> if PJ Fleck was a head coach of Ohio State, you guys would have a natty. No way. What do you mean, no way? This is oh, boy. Oh, 11 boy. and 2 no in 2019. 9 yeah. and 4. 9 and 4. I don't think it doesn't matter to me. What was, what was their Big Ten record? Because uh, I don't remember. Seven, the... All right. So outside of 2020, in 2019, <laughs> they went 7 and 2. In 2021, they went 6 and 3. In 2022, they went 5 and 4. Yeah, they went five and four in the West. I'm, yeah, I'm, because I'll, they're I'll Minnesota. On. I'll pass on PJ Fleck. Yeah. Okay, um, we can revisit your particular little snit about that later. Uh, Central Michigan, Michigan State, Michigan State uh, should Michigan win Michigan. that fairly, fairly handily September first. And now we get into the real schedule. Whoa, whoa, time, time out, time out. <laughs> handily, that that's a, I think that's a little bit of an over exaggeration. And by handily, I mean probably ten points. Do you do you not see that, Brock? I think no. that this is a. I think Michigan State's a duck. If I'm being honest. Oh. I I, I, I don't. So to quote Ryan Dunn, last time I spoke to him, Tuck ain't coming. All right. And no, no, I think no, if you no, look no. at that that roster, there's a ma- major question marks. They got some major question marks that come to maturity. And Central Michigan has been one of the upper echelon teams in that area okay. for kind of a while. So I, I I'm not. I'm not fully saying it's an automatic win for Michigan State. So Did, didn't didn't Jim Mack because Jim Mack went to Central Michigan, right? Yeah. Yeah. Didn't they lay an egg last year? Didn't they suck they last, did year? last year? They were not good last year. They correct. were not good last year, but if you look at his time there, they have you know. But he's only been there for like three years, right? That, that's that's the Jim McElwain thing. Good, good. 
also put out a win against a team you don't expect them to, though. Here, here's how I view Michigan State. Okay, I, I agree with you. Michigan State sucks. I got them at right around four wins this year. But Central Michigan, they're, they're, Michigan State still has really good linebackers and a really good offensive line and a really good defensive line. And against a team, uh, uh, you know, in the mid, that's not even a good MAC team, an average MAC team, that should be enough to smoosh them into the ground, I would think. Right? Because at that point, you're not trying to out athlete them. You're just trying to smoosh them. They, they have enough to do that, I think. I mean, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about that. Okay. So, well, we'll once again, we'll bring Josh on later in the season. One of you looks smarter. One of you will look less smart. Than <laughs> yeah, because I might be, I might be willing to bet on that. You seem pretty. <laughs> <laughs> you seem oh, pretty oh, 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 first of all, first of all, if we're talking money, that, that, that's a different. Because I'm thing. thinking the spread is going to be like 28 points, and you're over oh, here saying, I'll, oh, take, I'll, take, Mich- I'll take Michigan 10. plus 28 all day. No, 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 no. I'm saying that the Vegas spread is probably going to be 28, but you're over here talking 10. So if I get 10 from you, I'd gladly lay down some cash instead of going 28 to draft. Okay, make it 11.5. We might have something. Uh, okay. Work out your side bets off air, please. Uh, now, moving on to the rest of the. Uh, week the real week one or whatever you call it. Um, East Carolina at Michigan, Fresno State at Purdue, Utah State at Iowa, Buffalo at Wisconsin, Ohio State at Indiana, yeah. Towson State at Maryland, Toledo at Illinois, West Virginia at Penn State. You don't have to tell me about what you think happens to every one of those games, but if you see a potential upset anywhere on that list, call it out for me, please, Josh Keith. I got, I got, I got nothing so far. I got all my, I got all my, all my schedules written down and my predictions. I okay, mean, got it. Yeah, so I don't see nothing so far. Fresno State at Purdue. That's a major trap game for Purdue. First time head coach. Fresno State has Jeff Tedford has a great offensive system. The backup got a lot of experience last year when Jake Hayner was out. So, I'm just saying. Even though I know they lost Jalen Moreno Cropper. I know they lost David uh, Perel. Was that? I was saying Perel is right. Yeah, Painter, they lost. Yes, correct. Yeah. They, so, I, they lost some talent, but watch out. I'm with you. I, I actually wrote that down. Took me uh-huh. a while. He's in the back. I got I got Purdue losing to Fresno State, but I got a little star next to me. It's close. Yeah, I, I, oh. agree. I agree. I agree with that. So there you go. And in what will probably be the maybe the least watched, not the least watched, I'm exaggerating, but there will be some challenges associated. Uh, with this game, Northwestern at Rutgers. Um, this will be an interesting. Uh, this is how you know if you're truly a degenerate gambler. So, um, what do you think of that game, and who do you think prevails? Hit the under. <laughs> I, I'm. I wrote. I wrote down Rutgers. I wrote down it'd be close, but I wrote down Rutgers. I think Rutgers. that they got. Especially now, this was before the Fitzgerald thing went down, but especially now, right? You know, I me mean? Rutgers isn't. I mean, they they always had like one guy that could do something like it. You know, it kind of reminds their offense kind of reminds me back when uh, T. Y. Hill was at FIU, where it was like, "That's your only guy. That's your only guy." Like I'm trying to think, like uh, what was it, Melton? They had Bo Melton, right? They had Isaiah Pacheco. They always have one. You're right. There's, there's always one dude where if they just feed them, they can beat the really crappy teams. So I, I'm thinking that that's gonna be that's gonna be Rutgers. You know, and they got a good defense this year too. They got Aaron Lewis, Max Melton, Deion Jennings. They got some, they got some dudes on that defense. So I, I think that you know they're gonna suck still, but they should be able to beat Northwestern. Yeah, Northwestern was an 0 12 team last year that only has one win because Scott Frost had his head up his behind. I think yeah. crossing over the Atlantic from Nebraska to Ireland kind of maybe messed up his brain. Maybe reset it to a point where he was actually coaching good because he's really a bad ah. coach. And then throughout the game, the real reset started to wear off, and that's why he decided to kick an onside kick. Regardless of that point, no disrespect to Pat Fitzgerald, but uh, he probably should have been fired for just performance-based anyway. But, uh, yeah, no, I agree with you. Red Curse is going to win a hard-fought battle of 9-5. to five. It's going to be some <laughs> 19-08 score, 38 punts combined. Um, three missed field goals, all inside the 30. It's, it's going to be an old school football matchup. So, I'm like you're predicting inside run. All day. So, you're predicting a game where there is a, I'm guessing what you're telling me is there'll be a field goal and a safety, yep. and then either either three field goals or a touchdown and a mixed extra point in a field goal. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. Oh, no, you know, touchdown. Failed two-point conversion. Oh, okay. 
field goal. Do you do you guys team. have your like projected records for each team? Um, well, we, we I, we're, I, we're, going to, we're going to have yours momentarily. I hope. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. I just didn't know you guys spoke with such confidence about these games. I didn't know if you had like a. <laughs> yeah, but, I, have, I have I have my like averages. Oh, okay. But I I want to hit in order to speed things up because we love it, love you and we could do this forever, but we shouldn't. So I'm going to just hit on a few more key matchups and not walk week week by week. Um, so on October 7th, Minnesota, Michigan. Uh, at Huntington Bank Stadium, uh, which is on Minnesota's campus, the 105th battle for the Little Brown Jug. Tell me uh, what are the keys to that game? Who prevails? I think Michigan slams Minnesota. I think Michigan's a very good team. They found their groove. I think that they're going to be all undefeated all the way up to Penn State. You know, I, Blake Corm's going to be completely healthy. I don't think Minnesota can stop them. Um, you know, I. The keys of the game are all on Michigan. If they don't blow it, they should smush them into the ground. That might be actually an actual game that I might be willing to bet on if the spread is low enough because I'm thinking Michigan's going to blow them out by more than double digits. I don't think there's anything Michigan, Minnesota can really do to stop that attack. I okay. Uh, Wisconsin. A week later, Wisconsin goes to Camp Randall to face – I mean, Iowa goes to Camp Randall to face Wisconsin on the 14th, um, the 97th meeting of those two teams. Yeah. And – who wins and why? So I, I both I think both of these teams are going to be good, right? I, I, the Minnesota thing, I kind of crapped them all earlier, so you can kind of figure out where I think that they're going to stand. But both Wisconsin and Iowa are going to be good teams. I think Wisconsin beats Iowa. I, I don't think that, you know, it's still it's still Brian Ferentz calling the offense, right? Like, I don't think that they could be – it's in Wisconsin, right? They kind of got the upper hand there. I, 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 I do think it, it's kind of going to be Wisconsin all day. Um, and Braylon Allen is still a really good running back. I know the focus is on Luke Fickle and Phil Longo. You know, Braylon Allen is is arguably I, – I don't think he's that far behind Blake Corham, if at all, as far as the top running back in the Big Ten goes. You know, I mean, he, he's a dude. He can control the game, certainly. So I think that that's probably the key to the game there. Um, yeah, but I, I don't I don't know if I bet on this game because I do believe it's going to be close. Uh, but I do believe that Wisconsin is going to pull it out. Okay. And a week later – on the 21st of October, in Least Lansing, of course, there's the 116th meeting of the Wolverines and the Sturdy Spartans of Michigan State. Michigan overall has a 72, 38, and 5 record, but Jim Harbaugh is only 4-4 four and four against his in-state rivals. Uh, so, how do you think that team game plays out, and uh, you know, what does that game look like to you? Oh man, this is another one where I think Michigan State's going to be bad all year. I don't, I don't, I got them at four wins on the year, so I think Michigan just pounds them. I don't think Michigan State's good. I think that they messed up with Mel Tucker. <laughs> I think, I don't, I don't think they're good. I think that they got they're I think that they're good. They got, I got them at four wins, so I think that they crush Central Michigan, they crush Richmond, they crush Rutgers and in Indiana, and then they get pretty much crushed by everyone else except for Nebraska. I think they hang with Nebraska, but I don't think that that's going to be. They're just not good. They're not. They're not. They're, they're just not good. That offense is not good. I don't know what the plan is there. Yeah, they're not good. Michigan's going to take advantage of them for sure. Got it. So okay. They're, are they not good? <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're bad. I don't even know what their plan is. They're. You know. I. You asked me what, 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 like an underrated recruiting class, and I was writing them down because they got that quarterback from Canfield, and they got a couple smaller school guys. You know, smaller high school guys, and I was thinking, oh man. Michigan State's doing something here. And then I go to look at, like, you know, where they're ranking. Well, dude, everybody's got their recruiting class just, like, 30th in the country. I'm thinking, well, that's not underrated at all. That's a bad recruiting class. If you just got – there's no stars. I thought, you know, it's going to be ranked – I thought it was going to be ranked similar to that in Northwestern. So it's not. Michigan. It's just Michigan State's – I don't know what's going on there, but everything about them, that everything they touch is, like, super overrated now. It's crazy. Huh. Fascinating. Um, so my team that I sort of thought would – Breakout this year is Penn State. I'm going to talk about two of Penn State's key matchups. Uh, one at Beaver Stadium in University Park. Uh, that is, of course, the September 23rd game versus Iowa. And, of course, it is a night game, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. It's a 30-second meeting. And currently, uh, the Nittany Lions have a 17-14 edge. But the last two times they've met, Iowa has won. So... Uh, what does that game look like, and who wins and why? I think Penn State crushes Iowa. 
I, they're, they're playing at home. They're they're coming off of what should be a relatively easy win against Illinois as well. You know, I, I'm assuming I and again I was good, so I think I was going to have a good record. So Penn State's not going to be you know sleeping on them or anything like that. I think they're Penn State's got an incredible offense that I don't think I was I was whole thing is we got a good defense. We're going to slow you down. I don't know how you can slow this down. The backup running back at Penn State was started Iowa. You know what I mean? Like it's just it's I don't I don't know how you're going to do that. This offensive line at Penn State is so severely underrated. I think it might be one of the best in the country. No, no one's talking about it. No one's talking about it. It's one of the best offensive lines in the yeah, country. Yeah, that kid Panish is going to go probably in the top ten to twelve picks, right? And no, one's, and no one's talking about it. Yeah. No, one's, no one's talking about it at all. They got that. They had a guard come in that was starting last year, and then he got hurt, and everybody's forgetting about him. It's like dude, that guy was like all Big Ten, and then I think they got a transfer in. I mean, they're just they're they're a good team. I don't know how I. Iowa can't – they're not going to be able to keep up, right? Even if they stop them once or twice, they're just not going to be able to keep up. Now, that's all barring that, – that, that's enough time into the season. That's the fourth game, unless Drew Alar completely is average. But even if he is, if you, I would think that you could do a lot of damage just handing it off to Singleton. Yeah. And brings us next on the sticking with Penn State. Uh, Penn State then in a – maybe the most important game for them in the entire season – uh, Penn State has to travel to Columbus, Ohio on the 21st yeah. to face your Ohio State Buckeyes, their 38th meeting. The, currently, Ohio State has a six-game winning streak dating back to 2017. The last time Penn State beat Ohio State on the road was back in 2011. Uh, who wins that game and why? So I think this game is going to be really close. Uh, you know, every year I make every, – every year Penn State fans message me because it's always yada, yada, yada. But every year I make fun of him because James Franklin can't even read a clock. Like, it's just they, – they can't – he is not a good enough coach to close the gap. This year I think is different. They've made some changes. You know, and I don't want to be biased, but, you know, that that's how you have to be, right? You know, for instance, they hired Ola Adams, who was the defensive coordinator at Villanova, and that's a guy that they brought in. Villanova runs a very simplified defense. So – and that kind of makes me think that that's what they're going to be trying to do. Um, you know, when you're bringing in guys that have that kind of expertise at lower level positions, it makes me think that you're open to change. So I, I think that this is the year that Penn State's always had the talent. They've always had the talent close to Ohio State, Michigan. There's not a huge gap there. The difference is that James Franklin poops it away. Uh, I don't think that's the case this year. I think he goes down to Ohio State. They got a bye week the week before, basically, because mm-hmm. they're playing UMass. So we might as well call it a bye week. Ohio State's <laughs> got to play Purdue, which is at least a Big Ten team. So I think that that goes in their hand too. So I think that Penn, it lines up pretty well for Penn State to win. Although I do think it's going to be close. That might not be one that I, I bet on. And one last game left to discuss. It is the game in the Big Ten. It is, of course, your uh, Scarlet and Gray going up to the big house in Ann Arbor oh, on yeah. the 25th of November at 12 noon, a noon kick. The 118th meeting between Michigan and Ohio State. The Wolverines, of course, have a lifetime record of 60, 51, and 6 versus uh, the team down south, as they call it, and dominated the last two contests with a combined score of 87 to 50. I'm not saying that to hurt you, just factual information. So um, this year, what does that team look like and why? What? Give me at least one key matchup or key player on each side of the ball that you think has an impact on the outcome of that game. Well, I mean – I, I, I think that Ohio State, things line up really well for Ohio State to win this game. I really, truly do. I feel like I say that every year. But, I mean, Michigan plays Maryland the week before. Maryland is a very tough team. Ohio State plays Minnesota the week before at home. I, I think that this lines up pretty well. I mean, the player it, for Ohio State has got to be, I mean, Marvin Harrison. I think that if they dish him the ball, it's the pay. Well, I mean, I guess it's Kyle McCord because he's got to throw him the ball. But, I mean, I, if you revolve that offense around Marvin Harrison Jr., they can win every game. They really, truly can't. And Michigan, I don't think that they have the horses to keep up. They, What they've done in the past, and last year, I think last year was a little bit different because they, you know, they their offense was just so good and Jim Knowles had no idea what to do. This year they should be more prepared. But the offense, Ohio State's offense has not done bad against Michigan. They haven't done bad against Michigan before. The big playmaker for Michigan has got to be Blake Corm because he didn't play against Ohio State this year. What's a healthy Blake Corm going to do against Ohio State? You know that's a big question mark. That's a fear to me. That's a realistic fear to me. But I, you know, I don't. I don't think that. I think that Ohio State can can win this. I don't think that Michigan's. I mean, I know that Junior Coles and they got some good linebackers there, but I, I think that we can really take advantage of them in space. Um, I don't. I think JJ McCarthy's very. JJ McCarthy has a very high ceiling. 
But that is a quarterback that, that's not an elite quarterback. That is a quarterback that can't be beat. That is a quarterback that can be tricked. Michigan lost a lot of wide receivers. Cornelius Johnson, I guess, is another key player because if, I, I view him, with again, with a very high ceiling. But all these Michigan players have high ceiling. Without Michigan receiving course it's depleted. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. So Cornelius Johnson has to really step up like Braylon Edwards, David Terrell type to make to elevate this passing offense. And I, and I don't think he can do it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping Denzel Burke steps up at this point. He reaches his freshman stride. You know, he's a very physical player. I think it lines up really well for Ohio State to win this game. And if Ohio State loses to Penn State, I, I think that that actually works in their favor to beat Michigan, to be quite honest with you. Damn. Well, I guess Roman Wilson died or something. I, did I have a depleted wide? Wow! All right, all right, I don't. All right. I don't think. I don't think he's that good. To be honest with you, you know what I mean. You think he's a dude? He I, I, think, I think. I think he's I, I a day three pick. I mean, he's not. He's not. You know, Harrison Jr. or Mbuke or Fleming, but he's not a scrub. Damn! All right. All right. Yeah, but I, so I and like AJ Henning to me strikes more fear than him because AJ Henning has very unique speed. You could put him in a position, AJ Henning. You could put him in a position that Ohio State hasn't seen, right? That's that's kind of what happened last year. They used AJ. I think that was the first touchdown last year when they did a little reverse with AJ Henning. He's got very unique speed, but you know those other guys. Cornelius Johnson has the potential to be a unique receiver. You know he has the potential to be a slightly better uh, James Peoples Jones or uh, yeah Peoples Jones. Um, you, you know some, somebody that's a, that can be a difference maker, but I I don't know if he's going to re- you're for that to happen. Both JJ McCarthy. And Cornelius Johnson has to step up, and I don't know if that's going to happen. We know, even if McCord is average, because he's not going to be bad. At the worst case scenario, he's going to be average. Marvin Harrison Jr. and Ekka Booth are first-round picks, right? I mean, I should be able to throw a couple touchdowns to those guys, right? And then Julian Fleming, I'm expecting him to step up too. I I, I would think that, you know, Ohio State has – I mean, maybe Cornelius Johnson is better than Fleming, but, I mean, Fleming is, would definitely be the number two receiver by far, I, I would think. I just think that there's two obvious points that we're not touching when it comes to this game, and that is if Ohio State is going to be effective through the air, they got to throw in the snow. And that's something we haven't seen Kyle McCord do yet. And that's not an easy thing to do at, you know, the big house. The second thing is the reason why Michigan won the last two games is because their offensive line dominated the defensive line. We haven't seen anything to point to the fact that Ohio State's defensive line can handle that punishment over and over and over again. May I keep it? May I just add that? J.J. McCarthy adds a different non-mobile element. Even yeah. if he does throw some lame duck balls in the air, yeah. as long as they don't get picked off, which I don't think Ohio State truly has a DB that can be that dog at this point to go out and snatch balls from the sky instead of having it come right to them. You know, it's going to be really hard for Ohio State. Now, I'm not saying Michigan's going to win. I'm not saying Ohio State's going to lose. What I am saying is that don't discount Roman Wilson. Because I'm telling you right now, this dude is going to take a step up. He's going to be a senior. He can get in between pockets of space and – Whenever you kind of forget he's around, he scores a touchdown. So that's so. Just, so there's. There, I, I understand that, but we don't know it's going to be snowing, right? We do. We, we do know it's going to be cold. It's, cold. Court, it's going to be cold, though. But Kyle McCourt's from Pennsylvania, right? CJ Stroud's from California. Fine, I'll give you that. Justin Fields is from Georgia. Okay, I'll give you that. Kyle McCourt's from Pennsylvania. I think he can deal with some cold, and plus he's big, right? So his hands aren't going to. He ain't going to. You know, he, he can be all right in the cold. Um, you know, as far as the de- the defensive line goes, I don't think the defensive line got necessarily dominated. If anybody got dominated last year, it was the defensive backs. They were constantly out of position. Yep. Uh, J- Jim Knowles was completely – he was constantly being aggressive, so you'd see safeties blitzing. And then, it, yep. you know, McCarthy did, they did a great job of knowing exactly what was going to happen was going to happen. If anything, I think the defensive line, the offensive line, was more of a stalemate, and the defensive backs just got completely demolished, completely yep. demolished. I don't think that happened – just like you're talking about with Roman Wilson – Okay, well, we haven't seen Roman Wilson dominate. We've seen Denzel Burke dominate. Denzel Burke has been listed in every first-round mock draft I've seen, and there's a reason for that. Is he playing like a first-rounder? No, his last year was abysmal. Okay, but he's a very large physical cornerback who was dynamic in the freshman All-American who dealt with injuries last year. That's a guy who's who's prepared. That's a guy – you can you can literally expect to step up because it was due to injuries, right? And then they went out and they got a guy who started the SEC at Ole Miss, who was pretty solid to be the number two corner. That defensive back, and then they got an All ACC safety to come in and start, and then they got a former five star who literally reclassified so he could play sooner. I, I think that the defensive backfield should be better prepared for that, but that's not really even up to them. It's up to Jim Knowles to call the right plays, and he should be. 
better prepared for what Michigan's going to try to do. And I think that that's what's going to happen. But again, I could be wrong. But if I'm, I don't, I'm not going to bet on this game. This game is for sure going to be be close. But if you're asking me who I'm, I'm not scared of Michigan. I'm not. I think that that's that's a win. It'll be close, but I I put Michigan and Notre Dame as like on the same tier. Penn State. Oh, okay. I, that's a that's a little bit of an over exaggeration. Penn State scares me. That's the team that scares me because when you look, because their weaknesses aren't weaknesses. Their weaknesses are question marks, right? They're things that I haven't seen yet. That's different than a weakness. Michigan's weaknesses are, you know, they're things that are substandard, right? I'm that, not as afraid of Penn State as you are. I just want to add real quick. I'm not as afraid of that because, and the, not because of the players, just if you look at James Franklin's career there, the only time they've been able to pull off a major win yeah. is when something absolutely ridiculous, incredible, and unpredictable has happened. Yeah. If, no, you, need to, if you need to bank on that to secure a victory, it's not looking good. But once again, it's all hypothetical. We just got to wait and see. But I'm looking forward to, obviously, you know, digesting this next season with you two. And uh, I love Big Ten football, and it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, I, I'm, we could do this all night, but we should not do this all night. So I'm going to ask Mr. Keatley to tell everybody, all of your fans, and of course, as our number one friend of the show, tell people where they can find your work, where they can follow you, what you are working on, and uh and of course, we will have you back later in the season. Absolutely. Yeah. Follow me on Twitter at Josh Keatley16. You can see my work at Buckeyes Wire. Right now, I'm just doing lists of the top three positional players uh, in the Big Ten, just trying to pump out some content fast and furiously before training camp comes in. Um, you know, we're trying to get a podcast up, up, up and going, maybe try to interview some old Ohio State players and, and stuff like that. So, uh, you, but you know, that primarily see my work at Buckeyes Wire at Josh Keatley16. But thanks for having me on, guys. Oh, as always, it is an oh, honor, a privilege, and a pleasure. Um, so, for Brock Vieira and uh, for who else? Uh, oh, me. Yes, Bill Carroll. And, of course, Team MBS Sports as a whole. I want to thank, once again, Josh Keatley, who is amazing and amazing and fantastic and great. Uh, please join us again next week where we will keep doing the thing we do. Uh, and inspired by this, I think I may write about some impact transfer portal players uh, in the Big Ten. So look for that on Team MBS Sports because he, uh, some players I was thinking about, and he threw some others in my mind that now I think I'm going to write about. So thank you once again, everyone, for your time, your talent, your attention, Mr. Josh Keatley. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us on College Football Forecast presented by Team NBS. See you again in one week. And we...